This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. Support this podcast by joining the independent progressive media revolution today at humanistreport.com. Welcome to the Humanist Report podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is December 2nd. And this is the 71st episode of the podcast. Before we get started, I have to thank several new individuals for deciding to sign up and support the independent progressive media revolution. Today we have Brett Rundgren as well as Stephen B. So both of these individuals decided to support us either by becoming a member on humanistreport.com uh, through PayPal or through Patreon. So if you'd like to also support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can visit the links down below in the description box or you can simply support us for free by liking our videos, by sharing our videos, or by whitelisting us on Adblock. But uh, as long as you watch, that's all that I care about. So today we have a really great long episode for you guys. So I'll be talking about how a pro-Hillary hypocrite, Barney Frank, actually critiques Donald Trump now because of his Wall Street connection. Uh, DNC chair candidate Howard Dean denies the primary was rigged against Bernie Sanders. Also, Wasserman Schultz laughably claims that Hillary Clinton won the hearts and minds of voters. Hillary Clinton is rumored to be running again in 2020, so I'll talk about that. Also, I will tackle Newt Gingrich's ironic attack on Jill Stein. Nina Turner calls Howard Dean out for trashing Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, the Standing Rock protesters file a class action lawsuit against North Dakota police. And Bernie Sanders slammed Donald Trump's delusional tweets. So all of these topics and more will be discussed. Also, at the end of the episode, I have a special interview with Kyle. Kyle Kulinski, host of the Secular Talk Show. So all of these topics and some more will be discussed. Stay tuned and enjoy the episode. If the Democratic Party establishment gets their way, then the 2020 primary election will look a lot like the primaries in 2008 because Hillary's mini-me and Obama Jr. are already gearing up for a potential presidential run. Not kidding. <laughs> Page 6 explains, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is already reaching out to top Hillary Clinton donors about the 2020 presidential race. Sources tell us that the New York senator has been personally making calls to some of Clinton's biggest backers to, quote, talk about the direction of the country. One source said she isn't directly asking donors about her chances in 2020, but it is implied. However, while Gillibrand has close ties to Clinton's political network, the move hasn't gone down well with some of Clinton's supporters. Many of us still are grieving. It's like going after the widow at a funeral. So you can guarantee that if she's already contacting donors, she's going to run. Now, what's weird is that she really, really, really wants to sell out. It's evident. She's calling all the donors, asking what, you know, her chances are because they really are the ones that's in control of the Democratic Party and the political establishment. But what's weird is that she doesn't have to call the donors. Kirsten, you already sold out a long time ago. Look at your top donors. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley... Blackstone Group, USB AG, and furthermore, raising big money didn't work for Hillary Clinton, so why would you double down on a failure of a strategy? It's just very strange to me. Now, when it comes to Cory Booker, he is someone who's very charismatic, and to be fair to Cory Booker, he's a little bit better than Kirsten Gillibrand and Hillary Clinton, at least on speaking out about particular issues. He's less calculative, and he has uh, stood up for the Dakota Access Pipeline protesters and asked for the DOJ to investigate the violence being used against protesters. So, I mean, credit where credit is due. Uh, but I want to get more into this, because he really is being touted as the second coming of Obama. So Politico explains, Booker's name will inevitably be mentioned among the contenders for the Democratic presidential nomination in 2020. Before Clinton's loss, you looked at Booker as being too similar to President Obama to warrant serious consideration for the presidency. Their narratives were too much alike. In 2016, the fact that Booker was black, a junior senator, young, intellectual, and a commanding speaker argued against the presidential campaign because of the similarities to Obama. After four years of Trump, those attributes may be sought after. 
Booker didn't want to talk about that either. It's way too early to begin discussing 2020, he said. There is serious, serious work to do. I'm focused on what I have to do when I get back to Washington next week. Now, if you just listen to Cory Booker, he's very likable, he's a very charismatic speaker, and, you know, I think that as a candidate, he's alluring to some because of the way uh, he's similar to uh, to President Obama. And I actually really did like Cory Booker. I followed his career in my early college days. I followed his uh, race to be mayor in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, and first he failed, and then he ran again and eventually won, and now is a senator, obviously. But... The problem with Cory Booker is that you really have to look at the details because he has a lot of donors that Hillary Clinton also has. So even though there's this comparison to President Obama, he's really more like Hillary Clinton. So some of his top donors include J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Time Warner, just to name a few. So here's my message to Hillary's mini-me and Obama Jr., if you really do want to run for president, you're going to have a hell of a time convincing the American people that you are, in fact, on their side because you already sold out. You didn't even wait to run. You sold out to Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan Chase. You sold out. So how are we supposed to believe that you want to be on our side? Look, here's what you can do. Uh, if you really do want to run a campaign, one, you have to run as a progressive and actually champion a couple of progressive ideas and not just pay lip service to us. We actually have to believe that you're going to stand up for our values. And two, you need to not have a, a, a super PAC. You need to not take large contributions, but you've already done that. So, I mean, I don't know how you can possibly appeal to uh, progressives. What you should do is spend the next four years cultivating legitimacy among progressives specifically because that's where the grassroots activism is. That's where the heart and soul of the Democratic Party lies. And that's how you're going to inspire millennials to get out and vote who you need to win. It's very clear. Again, you guys thought that, you know, uh, you can win the election without millennials and without the base, without Bernie Sanders supporters. And that hubris gave us Donald Trump. So if you really are serious then take my advice. Don't be a sellout. Give back the money now that you gave to Goldman Sachs. Take a stand against political corruption and say, you know what, this money that I took was wrong. I'm going to give it back. I am going to denounce the corrupt campaign finance system that we have, and I'm going to fight for campaign finance reform. I want to get big money out of politics. I want to abolish super PACs, and I really want to fight for the American people. Do that, and maybe we'll believe you, but if you are thinking that you're going to run for president and have this cozy relationship with Wall Street like Hillary Clinton, you're not going to be successful. You might win the primary, but Donald Trump's going to win again. Uh, and that's going to be your fault this time. It was Hillary Clinton's fault this time, and then next time it's going to be your fault. So please, we want to escape Donald Trump. We all have a vested interest in defeating Donald Trump. Don't be dumb. Don't be corrupt. Be a progressive. Give back the money you took if you're serious about running. I wanted to share a short clip with you guys from MSNBC's Morning Joe, which featured an interview with a lobbyist named Howard Dean, who's currently running to be the next DNC chair. And he was talking about millennials and why they are disinterested in politics, generally speaking. But the host actually corrected him and said, well, they were interested in politics with Bernie Sanders, for example until Democrats rigged the primary. And his response to that was just tone deaf. So I wanted to share that and explain why there's broader implications to his comments here. Take a look. And the problem really? is none of them are interested in politics. It's the, it's the first global generation. Millennials. It, 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 yeah, I call them the first globals yeah. because they are the first globals. They are, and they believe in all of this. They are libertarian economically. I think right. they're interested they're deep, in politics. Uh, they were all over Bernie Sanders. They, they really were. They were, and that was and, great. But and look at you and me. But that and that was wonderful. But look at the turnout. Yeah, but it's because it was Hillary. But I'm that's sorry. because they rigged it for, Dem for Hillary, and Bernie never got a chance. You really well, can't I say that. Qu quite go that far. Oh no, right that's what happened. Well, I, yeah, the I don't. Emails. I don't. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, hold on. Let's not. Let's Twist not recap. All right, we were, let's not relitigate that. Let's not relitigate um, that stuff. Sorry, I'm not holding Please. any grudges. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> oh no, that's what happened. Well, I, yeah, the I don't. Emails. I don't. So yeah, let me just say that I love Mika Brzezinski. Uh, that, that was great. Uh, I wish that more people would actually call out bias when they see it like that. Now, I'm not showing you this clip because I just want to pick on Howard Dean, even though it is fun. <laughs> 
But I'm showing you this because it really proves why he's unqualified to be the DNC chair. Now, there's two reasons. So first, he doesn't understand why millennials didn't come out to vote in this election, which is a very simple explanation. And second of all, he refuses to admit that the primary was inherently unfair to Bernie Sanders and basically anyone that's last name wasn't Hillary Clinton. So when it comes to him not understanding why millennials refused to come out for Hillary Clinton, well, we have the internet. We're not stupid. Hillary Clinton said that she feels sorry for us because, you know, we don't do our own research. And that's why we're willing to believe that she is a sellout to the oil and gas industry, to the fracking industry, uh, to Wall Street. When, in fact, the reason why we don't like Hillary Clinton is because we do our own research uh, and because she was, in fact, a sellout and a corporate shell. So if you put up a candidate that is corrupt, we're not going to support them. And furthermore, Hillary Clinton didn't inspire them. We were apparently supposed to be inspired by the fact that she's a woman. And although I think that would have been a great, you know, a milestone in, in American history, that's not everything. If you don't have progressive policies that will actually help all women, poor women, women of color in a really substantive way, then how am I supposed to be overenthusiastic about that? And there's a reason why even younger women overwhelmingly supported Bernie Sanders. And that gets to another reason why millennials didn't come out to vote. The candidate that we wanted well, you guys rigged it against him. You were very critical of Bernie Sanders. You said that him, quote, attacking Hillary Clinton was harmful to the country. You were a huge surrogate for Hillary Clinton. So uh, if you really want to know why we didn't come out to vote, look in the mirror. And now when it gets to him refusing to admit that the primary was unfair, this is really, really important. Like, you know, nobody in the Democratic Party understands this, but unless you want to solve the problem, you have to actually admit that there's a problem in the first place. And nobody is willing to do this. The person who's come closest, believe it or not, is Donna Brazil. Because when Debbie Wasserman Schultz was forced to resign after the DNC leaks uh, revealed that she, in fact, was colluding against Bernie Sanders to destroy his campaign, well, Donna Brazil said, look, we need to stop being stupid, and I think the Sanders team is owed an apology. Now, later on, when she was implicated in the uh, John Podesta WikiLeaks, she she then uh, didn't want to talk about the substance there because we found out that she was also helping uh, Hillary Clinton as well. But the overall takeaway with this is that if you really, really want to get millennials to come back to the Democratic Party, you have to acknowledge and apologize to them for what you did during the primary. If the party doesn't acknowledge this and realize that it was a mistake, we are going to be inclined to believe that you will, in fact, do it again. And the reason why you don't want to acknowledge it is because you are doing it again. You're using these shady tactics to try to discredit your opponents uh, or any opponent of the establishment, really. Now, for example, Howard Dean is doing this himself. When he was talking about Keith Ellison and why Keith Ellison shouldn't be the DNC chair, this is what he had to say. I like Keith Ellison a lot. He's a very good guy. Uh, there's one problem. You cannot do this job and sit in a political office at the same time. It's not possible. We've seen what happens. Debbie Wasserman Schultz was not the only person to ever do that. It does not work. This is more than a full-time job. We have to rebuild from what has been a tragedy, uh, not only for the uh, Democratic Party, but uh, for we perhaps for the country. We don't know. So the person who literally is running to be the next DNC chair thinks that the reason why the last DNC chair was unsuccessful was because, you know, she had to split her time. She also served in the House of Representatives. And you can't do two jobs simultaneously. Being the DNC chair is a full time job. That's why you think she was unsuccessful, Howard. Really? Really? You're not going to bring up the fact that she was biased against Bernie Sanders and that there was a conflict of interest because she was Hillary Clinton's campaign co-chair in 2008. You're not going to mention that, the way she tried to destroy Bernie Sanders, the way that she didn't do the usual get out the vote campaign that Democrats do during the primaries because she was afraid that it would help Bernie Sanders. You're not going to mention that. You're going to bring up this bullshit point about her not being su successful because uh, she was only a part-time DNC chair and that Keith Ellison will be unsuccessful as well. No, this is a bullshit tactic. You don't know how to criticize progressives like Keith Ellison, so you have to make up these excuses in order to help the establishment and lobbyists like yourself get in so that way big money can still be in control of the Democratic Party. Mm -mm. No.
what you need to do is withdraw your candidacy for DNC chair because nobody wants you to be the DNC chair, Howard Dean, nobody. And look, you're just too out of touch. You're out of touch with voters. You don't understand why progressives are angry. You don't understand why the working class was angry. It's because your party abandoned them. You abandoned us. And now you think that you have what it takes to mobilize them again? You don't. You have no idea. You're clueless. This video illustrates exactly why you were clueless. We're sick of it. We're sick of you. Step aside and allow progressives to come in and clean up the mess that you establishment shills made. <laughs> Nina Turner and Howard Dean, who is currently a candidate for DNC chair, were on MSNBC with Chris Matthews, and they were discussing Tulsi Gabbard's meeting with President-elect Donald Trump. And during his interview, Howard Dean tried to slip in a little implication about Tulsi Gabbard that was just untrue, that he made up on the spot. And thankfully, Nina Turner called him out. Let me be clear. I will never allow partisanship to undermine our national security when the lives of countless people laid about. There's a woman, a, a politician, Kelsey, who is very anti-intervention, like yourself, what about this Middle East? Thing. We, she's against the whole regime change right. number. And now she's going there with a way of maybe saying, maybe we can cut a deal with Russia. Maybe there is a way to, to somehow end the bloodshed in Syria and keep us out. Well, I mean, That's she, what she believes, she's an she? interesting person. And the people from Hawaii basically have her tabbed as extremely ambitious with flexible principles. Really? Yeah. I mean, she was a lefty for Bernie, and now she's talking about running it against Maisie Hirono, who's a left-wing or liberal senator from Hawaii. So who, who knows what this is all about? You know, I mean, if the what's in it for What's in it for Trump? That's a very good question. Maybe he wants to be seen as, as, as reaching out to Democrats. Just to get back to the Rudy thing for a minute, you, do you, you know how this game is played. For all we know, Rudy's floating his own name, and then it's coming back around. Nobody yeah, met with him again this weekend. Well, he, because he's close to Trump. Well, they floated was, the idea of DNI for him. The director of national right. intelligence, that's not as high level as Secretary of State. Right. So they're, they're hurting him a little bit. The question is, why is it foreign policy? This is a guy with a lot of domestic but not okay. much. Well, I think I'm going to talk more about this at the end of the show. I think it's one reality show we've never seen before. This Trump parade of true. elephants. It's right out of Ringling Brothers. It's, <laughs> it is a show like we've never seen. And he's the ringmaster. Anyway, Howard Chris, Dean, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, Senator. Well, Congr Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard was, is a combat veteran. So I, I got to say that she has been true to her heart and what she believes in. And I think it was very smart of her to take the invitation of President Elect okay. Trump and put people over politics. So I, I don't okay. agree with the governor and that comment he made about well, the congresswoman. Wolf, wolf. So he said people in Hawaii have her tagged as extremely ambitious with flexible principles. What are you trying to suggest there, Howard Dean? Uh, and I like how Chris Matthews said, really? 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 He didn't even buy your bullshit. And Chris Matthews is pretty damn gullible, but he did not buy the bullshit you were selling there because... You know, it, it was pretty evident that you just made that up. Who said that? Which people in Hawaii are saying this about Tulsi Gabbard? Because I don't think that anyone can say that. If anything, she's shown, in spite of the disagreements that I have with her, that she's very receptive to public opinion. Uh, that she is listening to the progressive constituency of the Democratic Party. So I, I, I don't know where you're getting this from. And that's because you pulled it out of your ass. And again, let me read the quote back. Uh, people in Hawaii have her tagged as extremely ambitious with flexible principles. Doesn't this sound familiar to you, Dean? Doesn't this kind of sound like the uh, candidate who you endorsed during the primaries? Now, look, I'm, I'm really glad that Nina Turner actually came to Tulsi's defense, because if you disagree with Tulsi Gabbard for substantive reasons, that's great. But don't question her ethical standards when you endorse one of the most corrupt candidates to ever run for president. And again, look, in the midst of his little media tour to promote his candidacy to be the DNC chair, he's done more than enough to prove that he's unqualified to be the next DNC chair. Because think about the implications of this. He's trying to uh, implicitly slander Tulsi Gabbard. Yet Tulsi Gabbard is someone who might actually run for president in 2020. If you don't remember, we had this debacle during the Democratic primary where the DNC chair was very biased, didn't like Bernie Sanders, and tried to rig the primary against him. So you're already uh, displaying your dislike for Tulsi Gabbard, a progressive. So if you're a DNC chair, why should we believe that you're not going to do what Debbie Wasserman Schultz did and rig the primary against Tulsi Gabbard? 
We have no reason to believe that because you toe the party line no matter what, you're a partisan hack, and you don't really care or know what progressives want. You've disqualified yourself by making that statement because Article 5, Section 4 of the DNC Charter mandates neutrality from the DNC chair. How can we expect you to be neutral if you don't like Tulsi Gabbard? You think she has flexible principles. That's what many people are saying in Hawaii. You just disqualified yourself right there. You gave us every reason to believe that you're going to be biased and rig the primary against candidates who you dislike. You're done. Wrap it up. You're done. Go home. You just disqualified yourself. If you can't abide by the DNC's own charter like Debbie Wasserman Schultz, then you're done. Because look, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, she violated the DNC charter, and now the DNC is faced with a class action lawsuit. Do you honestly think they need another class action lawsuit when you get in and do the exact same thing as Debbie Wasserman Schultz? Is that what the Democratic Party needs? More class action lawsuits against them, Howard Dean? And furthermore, you're a lobbyist. So I, I just don't understand why you think you have the answers when you're so out of touch and when you sold out your principles. There was a time when you were, in fact, a progressive and where you were able to really galvanize millennial voters or younger voters. Uh, and you sold out. You became a lobbyist. You became a shill for the establishment. You became a shill for special interests. And now you're slandering progressives. And that was the biggest reason why Hillary Clinton lost was because she turned away the base uh, and split the base. And now you're showing us that you're going to do the same thing. So Howard Dean should withdraw his candidacy for DNC chair. <laughs> so Howard, so Howard Dean, Dean should withdraw, should withdraw his, his candidacy, candidacy for DNC chair. chair. The former chair of the House Financial Services Committee and pro-Clinton surrogate Barney Frank was on MSNBC and he weighed in on Donald Trump's choice for Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, who is a former executive at Goldman Sachs, and he was very critical of Donald Trump for his connection to Wall Street. Take a look. Donald Trump is in a difficult transition for him now from the rhetoric of his campaign to the reality. Of course, the very fact that he has now appointed a... Uh, uh, Mr. Mnuchin, who, who was an advocate of cutting back regulation on, among others, his former employer, Goldman Sachs, and Mr. Ross, a hedge fund uh, guy who's done a lot of trading. Um, this is probably the greatest bait and switch since Trump University in the sense that he promised people he was going to be tough on Wall Street and he was going to help the working guy. And in fact, he is Wall Street's best gift in many, many years. Isn't that a bit awkward for you to be saying, Barney Frank? Because you endorsed Hillary Clinton. Guess who she's friends with? Goldman Sachs executives. Uh, and also, as chair of the Financial Services Committee on the House, you took money from the industry that you were supposed to be regulating. Just for example, you took money from FMR Corp., which is a multinational financial services corporation. Uh, your other donors include J.P. Morgan Chase, American Bankers Association, Bank of America, UBS AG, Liberty Mutual, Bank of New York Mellon, Promontory Financial Group, Securities Industry and Financial Market Association, and the list goes on. So I think you're right to say that Donald Trump is in fact a huge gift to Wall Street. However, it's hypocritical coming from you seeing that you sold out the American people yourself and were bought off and corrupted by the banks that crashed the economy. And look, I'll give you some credit for Dodd-Frank because it is better than nothing, but you rejected any meaningful reforms that would actually rein in the big banks. But I mean, you've been out of office now for a couple of years, so during the primaries, you supported the candidate that wanted to break up the big banks and reinstate Glass-Steagall, right? Well, no. In fact, you were very critical of Bernie Sanders. You were a pro-Hillary Clinton surrogate, presumably because you wanted a spot in her administration. And this is what you said about Bernie Sanders. I'm sorry that Mr. Rice is kind of all the, the picking on poor Bernie, who has, of course, been uh, hypercritical uh, of others. And by the way, the thing that most bothered me in that, in that interview and, and elsewhere in the campaign is of a kind of a McCarthyite suggestion that uh, the reason big banks and other institutions haven't been criminally prosecuted uh, is in part because people have taken financial contributions. That, and that, by the way, is an attack on President Obama. Let's be very clear. 
The Secretary of State does not get to indict people. So the complaint that there were not criminal prosecutions has literally zero to do with, with, with Secretary Clinton. It's an attack on President Obama. I wanted there to be more prosecutions. There were some policy street choices I disagreed with. But, but Senator Sanders' consistent uh, uh, suggesting that somehow people were, were persuaded not to do that because of campaign contributions is, is, is a, as I said, it's a kind of McCarthyism. It's an accusation without substance. You literally stated that to question Hillary Clinton's connection to Wall Street and the financial contributions she's received, as well as the speeches that she's given to them and made so much money. I mean, we're talking about millions of dollars, $225,000 per speech. You said that that was McCarthyite to even question it. Unbelievable. Now, you also wrote this op-ed in Politico. You said, why progressives shouldn't support Bernie Sanders with the subtitle, wishful thinking won't win the White House. Well, apparently corruption won't either. Now, this is why Democrats have zero legitimacy. This is why the base tends to stay home, because you guys like to talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk, Barney. You defended a Wall Street shill like Hillary Clinton against someone that would have actually taken on Wall Street. And now you have the nerve to call out Donald Trump for being too close to Wall Street and say that he's the best gift to Wall Street in many years when the candidate that you endorsed was an even bigger gift to Wall Street. So yes, I do agree with you when you say that Donald Trump is a gift to Wall Street because he's proven that he is, in fact, a gift to Wall Street. However, you only call out that corruption when it happens on the right and not on the left as well. So it's okay when Democrats do it, but not when Republicans do it? Like, I don't get that logic. Why not just be consistent and condemn corruption and condemn any candidate or politician that's close to Wall Street, regardless of their party affiliation? Oh, that's right. You don't want to do that because you're a partisan hack. And also, you were looking out for numero uno. You wanted to be in Hillary Clinton's administration. You were hoping to actually get Steve Mnuchin's role. But the fact that Hillary Clinton lost, because we all knew that she was a Wall Street shill, and it was so obvious, that makes you mad. So now you're angry angry at others for doing what the candidate you endorsed is doing or would have done. Just stop, man. Look, you're discrediting the left even more than it's already been discredited. We're already demoralized. Democrats had their asses handed to them at this election. So you need to shut up. Actually try to fight for meaningful reforms or just just go away because we don't need to hear from you because you're a hypocrite, Barney. Debbie Wasserman Schultz was on MSNBC to discuss what Democrats got right, what they got wrong, whether or not they abandoned the working class. And in there, she was talking about Hillary Clinton and she made a claim, you know, just really brief in a very cavalier manner. But she made a claim that was so factually incorrect, it was just laughable. Let's remember that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. We actually won uh, the, the hearts and minds of a majority of voters. So, and we did a good job in many places at out organizing and out mobilizing the Republicans. Now, we didn't win the, president, the, the presidential election because of, uh, you know, we elect presidents based on the electoral college. So, making sure we take a good hard look at what we've done well and building on our success on what we have not done well. And, and one of those things is clearly one, not selling our agenda and uh, successfully, particularly to working and middle class Americans. And two, that we didn't promote well enough or make sure that that Americans understood what we did achieve for them. So I was surprised to hear her say, quote, uh, that the Democrats didn't sell their agenda successfully to middle class and working class Americans. I've never heard Debbie Wasserman Schultz say anything that's correct before, but that actually is agreeable. But, you know, I can't give her too much credit because what she said about Hillary Clinton completely canceled that out. She said, we actually won the hearts and minds of a majority of voters. Hillary Clinton, because she won the popular vote, won the hearts and minds of a majority of voters. Think about how ridiculous that sounds. Now, the reason why this is so ridiculous is because Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were the two most historically disliked presidential candidates in U.S. history. And... People who voted for Hillary Clinton, certainly many people who supported her, they supported her for strategic reasons because they didn't want Donald Trump to be elected. So they weren't voting for her because they were enthusiastic about Hillary Clinton. They just saw her as the uh, main way to defeat Donald Trump. According to Time Magazine, a Reuters Ipsos poll finds that 46% of voters who would support Clinton in a head-to-head -head matchup against Trump say they are primarily backing her because they don't want to see the business mogul become president, compared to 43% who say they agree with 
with most of Clinton's political positions. Similarly, 47% of voters who plan to back Trump say they're doing so because they don't want Clinton in the White House. So no, voting for Clinton to stop Donald Trump is not winning over the hearts and minds of voters. And in fact, more people voted for Hillary Clinton because they didn't like Donald Trump. So if you call that winning over the hearts and minds of voters... I just don't know. I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's it's factually inaccurate. It's not true. Okay. Voting for the lesser of two evils certainly isn't winning over the hearts and minds of voters. It's just not. And if Hillary Clinton wanted to win over the hearts and minds of voters, wouldn't we at least have to know what her campaign was about? Because I have no idea what her campaign was about. Her campaign slogan was, I'm with her. Her main pitch to voters was, vote for me. I'm not Donald Trump. I'm not joking. I mean, look at her ads. Putting a wife to work is a very dangerous thing. When I come home and dinner's not ready, I go through the roof. Grab him by the I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. And you can tell them to go themselves. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. These ads are an example of how Hillary Clinton, she didn't run a campaign based on policy substance, she ran an anti-Trump campaign. Now, to be fair to Hillary Clinton, uh, she did espouse a lot of platitudes, so it, was, it wasn't all just Donald Trump. For example, take a look at this ad. We believe that we are stronger together. We can't be small. We have to be as big as the values that define America. And we are a big-hearted, fair-minded country. We teach our children that this is one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I really don't know what any of that means, you know. <laughs> I don't. I'm sorry, but platitudes do not galvanize supporters to get off their asses and vote for you, okay? That's not how you win over the hearts and minds of voters. So if you run an anti-Trump campaign uh, based on not being Donald Trump and based on narcissism, no, you did not win over the hearts and minds of voters. Now, if you rephrase what you said and say that Hillary Clinton won over the hearts and minds of the political establishment— then yeah, I'd agree with you 100% there. But the fact that you say and think that Hillary Clinton won over the hearts and minds of voters is such an absurd claim. I mean, I don't give a shit if she won the popular vote or not. People were voting for Hillary Clinton to stop Donald Trump, and that is not something that you want to boast about. It's something that you should be embarrassed about. Donald Trump was very critical of Hillary Clinton throughout the process of his campaign, uh, and a lot of his criticisms were unfair, let's be honest, but there was a lot of truth to some of the criticisms that he did have against Hillary Clinton. So, for example, he critiqued her for having a relationship with Wall Street that was just too cozy. He railed against her corruption and spoke out against the favors that she did for donors to the Clinton Foundation when she was Secretary of State. Now, he also uh, criticized her heavily for mishandling classified information. However, now that Donald Trump is president-elect, he seems to be taking a lot of cues from Hillary Clinton. And he's not trying to copy any of the good things that Hillary Clinton had to offer. He's, he's really looking at all of the worst that Hillary Clinton had to offer and is implementing that in his own administration. So, for example, we all know that Hillary Clinton was very cozy with Wall Street, uh, specifically Goldman Sachs. She gave speeches to Goldman Sachs and was paid $225,000 for just one hour. Uh, she took millions of dollars from Wall Street. And Donald Trump rightfully called her out for that, but... He's kind of doing the same exact thing now. Politico explains, Goldman Sachs is dominating the early days of the incoming Trump administration. The newly picked Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin, spent 17 years at Goldman. Trump's top incoming White House advisor, Steve Bannon, spent his early career at the bank. So did Anthony Scaramucci, one of Trump's top transition advisors. Goldman's president spent an hour schmoozing with President-elect Donald Trump on Tuesday and could be up for an administration job, possibly as director of the Office of Management and Budget. People close to Cohn and the transition said Cohn, a longtime commodities trader, is friendly with Trump's powerful son-in-law, Jared Kushner. 
It's a stunning reversal of fortune for Goldman, a longtime Washington power that fell out of favor following the financial crisis. CEO Lloyd Blankfein got hauled before Congress, along with other Wall Street executives, to account for their behavior. And Trump, who ran as a populist and bashed Wall Street on the campaign trail, featured Blankfein as a shady and dangerous character in his final campaign ad. Now, we also know that Hillary Clinton, uh, as Secretary of State, she did favors for donors. She gave them special access and changed her political positions for them. Uh, and Donald Trump is showing that he's also doing favors for donors. So the Washington Post states the three latest nominees tapped by President-elect Donald Trump were major financial backers of his White House campaign. Their selection deepens the role that wealthy donors are playing in shaping the new administration, despite Trump's oft-repeated pledge to, quote, drain the swamp of special interests. Steve Mnuchin, Trump's pick for Treasury Secretary, served as his national finance chairman, helping organize dozens of high-dollar campaign fundraisers held across the country. Billionaire investor Wilbur Ross, who Trump selected as his Commerce Secretary, was an early financial supporter of Trump's campaign. Trump selected Chicago Cubs co-owner Todd Ricketts to serve as Deputy Commerce Secretary. His father helped finance Future 45, a super PAC that spent lavishly for Trump in the final weeks of his campaign. TD Ameritrade founder Joe Ricketts gave the group at least $1 million through the end of September FEC filing show. That sounds a bit like corruption now, doesn't it? Those spoils that he's giving to donors to reward them for helping him get elected, that's a form of corruption. Now, let's be fair to Trump. Obama did it. Hillary Clinton certainly would have. But when you say that you are anti-establishment and you're going to drain the swamp, well, you're a hypocrite. You're just like Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, in this way. Now, also, he criticized Hillary Clinton heavily for mishandling classified information. Well, Donald Trump is choosing to associate with people that also mishandled classified information. According to ABC News, General Petraeus got himself into a situation where he eventually pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor federal charge of mishandling classified information, leading to his resignation as the director of the CIA. The charge stemmed from the fact that while he was commanding U.S. forces in Afghanistan, Petraeus kept copious notes and black books that he kept secret from the Defense Department and the CIA. They they contained highly classified information, including code names for operations. He kept those books at his home and later handed them to his mistress, Paula Broadwell, for purpose of writing his biography. And according to the federal indictment, he lied to investigators about possessing the books and sharing them with his biographer. This guy might be Donald Trump's secretary of state. <laughs> so... You're picking a secretary of state that would literally have to check in with this probation officer every time he wanted to leave the country to conduct foreign affairs? I mean, look, you were right to criticize Hillary Clinton for that, but now you're a hypocrite. Now, another idea he borrowed from his good friend Hillary Clinton. In this now infamous tweet, he states, Nobody should be allowed to burn the American flag. If they do, there must be consequences, perhaps loss of citizenship or a year in jail. Now, that actually looks pretty similar to a bill that Hillary Clinton co-sponsored in 2005 that sought to penalize desecration of the flag with up to one year in jail or a $100,000 fine or both. So the takeaway is that Donald Trump supporters were conned by him. They voted for Donald Trump to defeat Hillary Clinton because they didn't like Hillary Clinton and they opted to not support Jill Stein or Gary Johnson, uh, and they were conned. He is very similar to Hillary Clinton, and that shouldn't be shocking to anyone because they were friends prior to this election. I mean, Bill Clinton literally influenced Donald Trump to run for president. They're friends. They're in the same social circle. They're elites. They like each other. They don't hate each other like they did when they were opponents. They actually like each other. And the only way that Donald Trump could be more similar to Hillary Clinton was if he literally married Bill. So, <laughs> the conclusion here is that Donald Trump is being everything that his supporters hated about Hillary Clinton, but perhaps worse. And this is only the beginning. He didn't even take the oath of office yet. And he's already demonstrating his capacity to be just as corrupt as the elites he railed against in Washington. He's already proving to be a corrupt corporate puppet. Donald Trump, if you really want to copy Hillary Clinton, I mean, can you at least copy the good stuff? 
I mean, Hillary Clinton, she would have protected women's reproductive rights. Uh, she actually had a pretty robust mental health plan that would expand coverage to millions of Americans, potentially. Why don't you copy those things? Don't copy the corruption. Don't copy the mishandling of classified information. Don't copy the spoilage. Copy the good things. But I mean, again, Donald Trump, he, he can't help himself. You're rich. You're greedy. So you get an office and surprise, surprise, you're going to be greedy just like you were in real life. So Donald Trump is the new Hillary Clinton. His supporters may not like that, but it's true. And throughout his tenure as president, you're going to see that he's very similar to what we dislike the most about Hillary Clinton. So if you voted for Donald Trump, I'm sorry, but you were conned. Bernie Sanders was on Conan O'Brien's show, and he was asked about some of Donald Trump's more crazier tweets, and I wanted to share his opinions because I think that Bernie Sanders really decoded Donald Trump's tweets in a really meaningful way that's important. Uh, so when it comes to this tweet, in addition to winning the Electoral College in a landslide, which is untrue, I won the popular vote if you deduct the millions of people who voted illegally. Now, Bernie Sanders had this to say about that tweet. I'll tell you what my take is. First of all, it's delusional. It's totally insane. Nobody believes that who studies elections or election patterns. But number two, this is what is scary about it. When he says that, he's really sending a signal to Republicans all over this country, Republican leaders. And what he's saying is, we have got to suppress the vote. We have got to make it harder for poor people, people of color, immigrants, and elderly people to participate because they may be against us. And that's scary stuff. My own view is we have got to work overtime to bring more people into the political process, not make it harder for people to participate. But that's really what he's saying. Everything that Bernie Sanders said is 100% true. Uh, what Republicans always do is they try to create this problem and then apply a solution to it that ends up screwing up the country. I mean, voting is just one of many. For example, Social Security, they'll say, well, Social Security is going bankrupt, so we have to do something now. We have to act now. Uh, and if we don't, it's going to be destroyed. So the best thing we can do is privatize it. Now they're doing this about voting. They'll say, look, so many people are committing voter fraud that uh, we have to do something. We have to act quickly and we have to try to suppress the vote more. But that's factually inaccurate. I study elections and electoral patterns. And no, voter fraud is not a thing that is prevalent in the United States of America. And in fact, the two instances uh, that are documented of voter fraud were voter fraud that helped Donald Trump during this election. So that's bullshit. Now, another thing uh, that I do think Bernie Sanders didn't consider is Donald Trump's ego. I think that's part of it. Donald Trump hates the fact that he won the election without winning the popular vote. It probably eats away at him that technically more Americans wanted Hillary Clinton to be president uh, than him. And technically, more Americans, when you factor in Gary Johnson, Jill Stein, and Clinton's voters, voted against Donald Trump. And that probably kills him because this guy is an egomaniac. So I think that's also a part of it. Now, another tweet here. Nobody should be allowed to burn the American flag. If they do, there must be consequences, perhaps loss of citizenship or a year in jail. Now, this was Bernie's response. Two responses to that. We have massive income and wealth inequality, 43 million people living in poverty. We have to deal with climate change, which is threatening the existence of the planet. And he's talking about three people who might burn the American flag. But the second point there, there's a hidden message in that. And that is, be careful if you are prepared to dissent. Now, the Supreme Court has said that's within the constitutional framework. That's a form of expression. But what he's really saying is, if you want to dissent, be careful. It's not just the American flag here. We're watching you. That's what's scary about that. So I, I agree again with Bernie Sanders here. This really is about dissent for Donald Trump because I think that he really does have authoritarian tendencies. He doesn't want people to question his legitimacy. He doesn't want people to disagree with him and present facts to dispute his absurd claims. So he's trying to shut down freedom of speech, even though he claims to be in favor of it because he's against, you know, political correctness. But really, all he is is a right wing social justice warrior, as my buddy Kyle Kalinske of Secular Talk says all the time. So Donald Trump is a dangerous figure. And look, to be fair, this is something that Hillary Clinton also proposed. So maybe it's the case. There's a small sliver of a possibility that he's trying to put this forward and see how the media reacts. And will say, well, look, uh, Hillary Clinton proposed it. Why aren't you going after her? Is it because you like Hillary Clinton more? I think that is possible. But at the same time, I do really believe that Donald Trump uh, thinks that people should be penalized for freedom of speech. 
Again, it's a piece of material. This is a flag we're talking about here. If you think somebody should lose their freedom or citizenship because of their wanting to protest, which is what this country was founded on, uh, you know, the First Amendment, it's the First Amendment because it's pretty important. We decided to put that ahead of all the other ones. If you decide to violate the Constitution because you don't like when people disagree with you, tough shit, because we are going to do that, and we're going to do it vocally. So I think uh, Bernie Sanders, what he's saying here is really important, and I'm glad that someone has uh, <laughs> has the spine to speak out against Donald Trump and really decode what he means. I always appreciate Sarah Palin's political commentary because she tends to look at the world of politics through a more alternate lens than the rest of us. So she decided to weigh in on the 2016 election and share her reasons as to why she thinks Donald Trump was victorious over Hillary Clinton. Now, is she going to talk about how Hillary Clinton failed to appeal to working class voters? No. Is she going to talk about uh, how Trump maybe was successful because he championed uh, economic protectionism? No, she's not going to talk about that either. This is Sarah Palin's theory as to why Donald Trump was successful. Sarah Palin has insisted God intervened in the U.S. election and Donald Trump's victory was partially prompted by people praying to God that U.S. citizens should, quote, wake up. No doubt, divine providence played a huge role in this election, she told listeners on Breitbart News Daily's radio show. I will boldly proclaim that I saw it firsthand. I was there on the campaign trail. I saw how things were changing. I saw more and more people's eyes open, and I think so much of that was based on the church in general. Those people of faith who were praying to God that people would wake up. Remember, our founders dedicated this land, this new country that would be America, this idea of America, they dedicated it to God. If I were president, I'd rededicate us to God. Prayer warriors across the country, people who perhaps had never expressed their faith in a higher being before, knew that, geez, <laughs> we gotta be on our knees, <laughs> oh God, asking for a change here, because we're going down the wrong road. She later added, I was so grateful, I was so grateful to see so many people step up in that realm. Now, if you think that's weird, well, you're just wrong because she's not alone in that opinion. There are other people who agree with her, and I think that the analysis from Michelle Bachman really explains it well. Then you look along the timeline, and exactly, this is 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We went on the air. That's when we went on Daystar. We went so on Daystar. Thank you, 7, Marcus Lamb, right there. At 7.30 at night, we went on the air, but we have a prayer room here. Yeah. We had people all across the United States joining with our prayer room here in Dallas in prayer. And look what happened. This was the moment when the whole race broke, when prayer began, the, the church came out. And then we see uh, a 30 point swing here, a 30 point swing here. And now we see the swing to 95 percent chance of winning Trump, 5 percent chance of winning Clinton. It's phenomenal. This graphic that was produced by the New York Times should tell believers and pastors the power of prayer, the power of action. And here it is, a graphic. The night isn't even over. The decision hasn't even been fully made yet about the presidency. And already we know that the glory goes to the God Almighty. The God of the universe, the sovereign Lord. He is the one who did this for us. Alrighty then. There you have it. Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman, they claim that, you know, it wasn't about demographic differences. It wasn't about, you know, voter turnout. God did it. God is responsible for this election. So I'm going to accept your theory for a minute. Let's assume that God does in fact exist and that divine intervention was what led to Donald Trump's electoral uh, success. Uh, so let me ask you this, if there really is power in prayer, why don't you guys pray that the limbs of amputees will grow back? Is that, you know, is that so absurd to ask? I mean, if really 
God is omnipotent and he walked on water, anything is possible, right? Is it not? So why don't churches come together and do what they did for this election and pray for the limbs of every amputee in the world to grow back? I mean, do you pray that you can fly? Again, if God is omnipotent, anything is possible. So do you pray to get special flying abilities? And also, I have a question for you. So you guys told us that God wanted Mitt Romney to win in 2012. So you prayed then for, uh, for Obama to be defeated, but he wasn't. So why was it that God chose uh, Obama then, but Donald Trump now? Why is it that God preferred the candidate that said he wanted to kill civilians in Middle East and North African countries? And furthermore, I mean, if you really can pray for anything, uh, you know, and God is your personal genie, look, I wish I was a little bit taller. I wish I was a baller. I wish I had a girl that looked good. I would call her. Okay, I'm going to get a copyright strike. But I mean, <laughs> the point is that if anything is possible through God, why do you limit yourself to what you ask? Why ask him uh, about trivial things like the American election? Why not ask him to save the planet? Why do you ask for things that are only uh, within the realm of possibility? And what about the people that prayed for Hillary Clinton to win? Does God just base his decision off of the plurality of prayers that come in and support one candidate over the other, or is the process more nuanced? I mean, these questions might sound ridiculous, but if you really accept the position uh, that Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman have and follow it to its logical extreme, then... These are things that are reasonable to ask. These are reasonable questions to have about religion and God and divine intervention. Why can't I pray to fly? And what's funny is that whenever I talk about religion, my international viewers will chime in and be like, okay, I feel like you guys are kind of exaggerating a little bit when you talk about the extent to which uh, this is prevalent in America, but it's, it, it's very prevalent. Everyone knows at least one person uh, that is this level of fundamentalists, right? We all have someone in our family, a crazy uncle. Uh, we all know someone who is this detached from reality. We have to worry about this because Sarah Palin may very well serve in Donald Trump's administration. So we have to stay vigilant. Uh, we have to watch them because this level of crazy is in the White House. The monkeys have taken over the zoo. And we need to be very wary about what they might actually do if they truly do believe that uh, they're following, following out the will of God. At a meeting with Palestinian leaders in June 2003, then-President Bush reportedly having claimed that God told him to go to war. Mr. Bush reported as having said, quote, God would tell me, George, go and fight those terrorists in Afghanistan, and I did. And then God would tell me, George, go and end the tyranny in Iraq, and I did. The violence and sheer brutality being used against the Standing Rock Sioux tribe over their protests of the Dakota Access Pipeline by militarized police has been just absolutely gut-wrenching. However, in spite of this, they're, they're remaining relentless. They're not going anywhere. And now they're actually fighting back. How? Well, they're filing a class action lawsuit against the sheriff in the county where all of this violence is going on. The Intercept explains, the lawsuit alleges that sheriff's deputies and police officers used excessive force when they deployed impact munitions like rubber bullets as well as explosive tear gas grenades and water cannons against protesters. It argues that the tactics were retaliatory, punishing those involved for exercising free speech rights. It also argues that officers were were inadequately trained to handle the situation, naming Morton County Sheriff Kyle Kirchmere, Mandan Police Chief Jason Zegler, and Stutzman County Sheriff Chad Kaiser as defendants. Plaintiffs, represented by the National Lawyers Guild's Water Protectors Legal Collective, requested a restraining order and preliminary injunction that would bar officers from using such weapons against people protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline. The suit awaits a decision from a federal judge on whether to approve class action status. In declarations to the court, pipeline opponents involved in the November 20 clash described in detail the severe injuries they sustained. Most stated that protesters were nonviolent and that they heard no order to disperse. And uh, just to give you some examples of the injuries sustained by protesters, a woman was hit in the eye by a tear gas canister. One man might now need reconstructive surgery on his finger after being hit by a rubber bullet. Another man lost consciousness and had to get 17 staples in his head after he was shot by a rubber bullet. 
in the head. Now, also, there is the case of Sofia Wolanski, who almost lost her arm. It looks like it's going to be okay for now, but she's never going to get full function back in her arm again. Uh, and this was because she was hit with a concussion grenade. Now, this doesn't include other concussions and respiratory injuries. Also, many of the water protectors are developing pneumonia uh, and just getting sick because they're spraying protesters with water that's really cold in literally freezing cold weather. This has consequences. And I don't think that the uh, police officers or the North Dakota government care. I don't think that the governor of North Dakota gives a shit about the well-being of protesters, even though he claims he does because he issued an immediate order for them to leave the premises because of cold weather. Well, if you're worried about the health and safety of protesters, stop shooting them with cold water. Stop using violence against them. But, again, they don't care. What they care is about the bottom line, about profits, and this company is just... It's terrible. What they're doing is terrible. This isn't just state-sanctioned violence. This is actually uh, private mercenaries that they hired as well. Now, I don't know the extent to which they're still there, but the oil company literally hired mercenaries and had guard dogs attack the protesters when they were peaceful. These people are non-violent. They're not rioting. They're not destroying anything. They're praying. They're chanting. They're cheering. They're singing. So how is using violence against them justifiable? The answer is it's not. Now, what we have to do is call on Obama to act and to speak up and grow a spine while we still have time. And now we have to start pressuring President-elect Donald Trump to take a stand. Which side is he on? Is he on the side of the oil pipeline and North Dakota police who are actually using violence against protesters? Or is he going to stand up for the sovereignty and clean drinking water rights? of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Oh wait, we know actually what side Donald Trump is on because he actually has stock invested in the Dakota Access Pipeline. So government has complete and utterly failed us at the federal and state level. And when that happens, you've got to take matters into your own hands. And that's what these, these protesters have done. And again, uh, I commend them all. You know, stay strong. Uh, you guys are very courageous. So uh, try to be safe if you can. So at this point, it's become pretty evident that the Democratic Party establishment has not learned their lesson after getting their asses handed to them by Republicans in this last election. Uh, and after eight years of Republican obstructionism, they're not gearing up to fight back against the Republicans and try to destroy them the way that they destroy progressives in their own party. They are showing us that they are going to roll over and die. They've given us many indications of this. So to give you one example uh, from the Hill here, Representative Elijah Cummings says his party wants to cooperate cooperate with President-elect Donald Trump's agenda where they can find common ground. I guarantee you we will be reasonable. We will work with this president, he told host Chuck Todd on MSNBC's MTP Daily Wednesday. There are going to be things we can work together on. Now, I want to be clear here. Bipartisanship, in theory, is not a bad thing. But what he's really saying there uh, and what history has shown us is that when Democrats say they want to work with Republicans, that means they're going to just completely roll over and die and allow Republicans to do whatever they want. I mean, when we had a Democratic president in the 90s, Bill Clinton, he signed Republican welfare into law that gutted welfare. He signed NAFTA. It's just ridiculous. So this isn't something that we should commend them for, for taking the higher road. Now, uh, thankfully, uh, Elizabeth Warren decided to call them out and urged Democrats to not be spineless and to actually take a stand against Republicans. She states, speaking of the popular vote totals that favored her party, Warren said, the American people didn't give Democrats majority support so we could come back to Washington and play dead. They didn't send us here to whimper, whine, or grovel. They sent us here to say no to efforts to sell Congress to the highest bidder. They sent us here to stand up for what's right. Now they are watching, waiting, and hoping, Hoping we show some spine and start fighting back when Congress completely ignores the message of the American people and returns to all its same old ways. Yes, Warren acknowledged, Republicans will control this government, but, she concluded, they cannot hand over that control to big corporations unless Democrats roll over and allow them to do so. Now, I've been a longtime fan of Elizabeth Warren, and I commend her for saying this because Democrats needed to hear it. Uh, they don't have a spine. They always tend to roll over and die. They don't know how how to play politics, even though they're on the right side of the issues, uh, at least symbolically anyways. But I mean, 
they always want to work with Republicans when Republicans want nothing to do with them. They always try to extend a hand out to Republicans uh, and they get shot down every single time and they never learn their lesson and it damages the country. And right now, we have a minority party controlling every branch of government. Only 26% of the country is registered as a Republican. So if you don't stand up for us, if you actually buy into this bullshit narrative that they have a mandate then you're horribly mistaken. Republicans never have a mandate because they only win when voter turnout is low. That's not a mandate. That's showing that uh, the country is demoralized. But here's a problem that I have. It's the messenger. Elizabeth Warren, she, you know, she, she definitely knows how to talk the talk. She's illustrated that by far. Uh, and I think that, sure, Democrats did need to hear this. However, Elizabeth Warren, you've got to start walking the walk. When you talk about Democrats needing to uh, grow a spine, where have you been on the Dakota Access Pipeline? We have the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe being uh, brutalized by North Dakota police over their protest for the Dakota Access Pipeline, and you've been silent. You won't even release a single tweet speaking out on their behalf, speaking out against the violence, condemning the violence. Where have you been there? So if you're going to talk about Democrats needing to grow a spine, how about you lead by example, Elizabeth? How about you actually start speaking out for progressive issues and come to our defense once in a while because we look to you as a leader and you've done nothing to prove to us that you are in fact a leader and you were silent during the primaries. You can really make, up to, make that up to us. If you are planning on running, you could recultivate the legitimacy that you lost during the Democratic primaries in 2015 and 2016. Uh, by your silence, and you can make it up to us and really be a progressive champion and speak out on all progressive issues, not just issues that impact Wall Street. And, you know, that's important, but I just want you to have a spy on yourself, Elizabeth Warren, and show Democrats why we need real progressive vocal people in government, and maybe they'll follow you. I mean, they see how popular you are, but yet you're silent on so many progressive issues. You were silent on Bernie, you're silent on Dapple. You have to start speaking out, Elizabeth, and lead by example if you really want the rest of the party to take you seriously. Newt Gingrich was on Fox News to promote his shitty new book, and he was asked about Jill Stein's recount effort, and he took the opportunity to attack Jill Stein and imply that she's crazy. Take a look. In the description <clears throat> on Amazon.com, it says this. Treason is a story of a nation fighting for its life, not only against outside threats, but also against an internal threat. Now, in this case, it's terrorism in your book. But that's what Jill Stein says. She, she doesn't want an internal threat. That's what she's saying. That's what she's fighting. What's your take? <laughs> well, let me say also that, that tragically, uh, the killing, uh, or, the, or rather the knifings at Ohio State resemble part of what we have uh, in treason, which does deal with international efforts by Islamic supremacists. Uh, I, I would say that Jill Stein represents sort of the nut wing of American politics. When, when the left loses as badly as they have at every level, from, from local state legislature to governor to Congress to the presidency, you begin to get the sort of nut friend showing up. The fact that Hillary's people are associating with her, I think tells you how desperate and how disoriented Hillary's campaign has become. Uh, and the whole thing is a joke. So I take it that the irony of his statement was lost on him there because for him, of all people, to suggest that anyone is fringe or is from uh, the nut wing of American politics, it's just hilarious because Newt Gingrich is someone who's not just a nut. I think he's just weird, generally speaking, but let's get to some of his fringy political ideas. So, Newt, you're against contraception, and you're also against abortion. If you allow people to have contraception, then that would lead to less abortions. You also said that marijuana legalization would tear America apart. <laughs> How? <laughs> if by te tear America apart, you mean uh, increase our tax revenue and lead to less people being arbitrarily arrested, then yeah, I think it would tear America apart. That's just a weird opinion. Also, you want to increase penalties for people caught with drugs. Uh, you're effectively in favor of an American theocracy. You want creationism literally taught in schools, and you support a constitutional amendment for school prayer. You also said that you want to, quote, recenter America on the creator. 
What does that even mean, Newt? I don't know what that means. What evidence do you even have for the existence of a creator? Now, you once co-sponsored a bill in 1989 that stated that climate change was, in fact, anthropogenic and stated that our country must take action to address it. But a couple of years later, you said that you weren't sure if man-made climate change was real. <laughs> Gotta tell the party line, though, right? Now, here's what's weird. You said that you want to, quote, reward high school girls who graduate as virgins. That's really, really, really weird, Newt. That's really weird. What do you, do you give them a badge of honor, a medal? And how is this verifiable? I mean, this is so strange. This is such a strange position to take, Newt. And you're also a hypocrite. I'll tell you why in a second. So you cheated on your wife while she had cancer and broke your own marriage vows, yet you're against same-sex marriage because it's sin. <laughs> that That's really weird. Uh, you also called Palestine, quote, an invented people. Uh, you called President Obama a socialist, which illustrates that you have no idea what socialism is, and you want to privatize social security. Those views are not just fringy and weird, but the American people don't agree with you on those positions, Newt. You're fringe. You're the definition of fringe. You're just weird. So to suggest that Jill Stein is the one that is fringy or is from the nut wing of American politics, as you like to put it, just because she's from a political party that's disenfranchised by our biased electoral system, well, that's that's not what makes you a fringe idiot, Newt. What makes you fringy is your insane policy positions. And you've got more than enough to suggest that you are a crazy person. You are a nut. And another thing I want to address here, uh, he talked about how foreign hackers couldn't hack paper ballots. Now, I don't think that foreign hackings is a phenomenon that's very likely. I don't think that played a role in this, in this election. However, by saying that, you look like an idiot because the fact that the machines that count the paper ballots aren't hooked up to the internet that that's not what we're worried about what we're worried about is the memory cards that you insert into the machines that count the ballots those are hackable i mean this is verifiable you can look at the hacking democracy documentary on hbo i actually interviewed the director and will be penning an article about that documentary uh pretty soon that's what we're worried about so you're just uninformed. You don't know about the facts. Uh, if you were actually challenged to a debate by Jill Stein, you would get crushed because you are uninformed. You're a wackadoo. You're just a crazy person. And to really illustrate that once more, I'll go ahead and leave you guys with this video of our good friend Newt Gingrich here. We're really puzzled. Uh, here at Gingrich Productions, we've spent weeks trying to figure out what do you call this? Now, I know you probably think it's a cell phone. And if I say to audiences, how many of you have a cell phone that takes a picture, 97% of the hands go up. But think about it. If it's taking pictures, it's not a cell phone. If it has um, a McDonald's app to tell you where McDonald's is from, based on your GPS location, that's not a cell phone. If you can get Wikipedia or go to Google, that's not a cell phone. If you can watch YouTube, that's not a cell phone. Or Netflix. Think about it. This device is something new and different. I've been calling it a handheld computer. But I decided that really was misleading because, you know, while it has the computing power of a 2003 laptop, its real power is not internal computation. Its real power is networking. It's connected to the entire world of information and the entire world of communications. And of course, this is just a work in progress. This is this, is this year. The, the first cell phone call was 1973. The first commercial cell phone was 1978. We have been accelerating ever since in the capability of a handheld device. So we'd love to have your ideas and your thoughts. Please leave a comment. What would you call this so that we could explain to people that they carry in their hand literally the potential to have a dramatic revolution in how we get things done and how we take care of our own health and how we interact with our government and how we are productive. And I think that we need to have a new conversation about recentering American politics and government around the kind of breakthroughs that this makes possible. So we look forward to hearing from you. All righty then. 
So there's been some speculation and inklings and little rumors here and there that Hillary Clinton is not ruling out another presidential run in 2020. So according to Inquisitor, the rumor originated from a tweet by Ron Fournier, a former senior political columnist at National Journal and longtime member of the White House press corps who has covered the Clintons for years. Fournier claimed in a tweet to followers on Monday, November 28th, that Clinton's decision to challenge the legitimacy of the 2016 general election results by participating in the effort by Green Party candidate Jill Stein to recount votes in swing states Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan was part of moves designed to, quote, keep her options open with regard to a possible decision to run for president in 2020. Now, even Fox News picked up on the story. And we may now know what Hillary Clinton is really doing in the woods in addition to taking selfies with fans. It turns out some say that she may be laying the groundwork for a third run in 2020. A former columnist for the National Review says her random viral encounters with so-called average voters may not be so spontaneous after all. The report also says that Clinton's campaign support for recounts in those three battleground states is all a part of a bigger plan hmm, to keep her options open for 2020. Yeah. So is there a sufficient amount of evidence to actually validate this rumor? No, there's not. It's based on speculation from one journalist that's a conservative journalist. Uh, so do I believe that there is really any reason to believe that Hillary Clinton will in fact run for president in 2020? Well, no, not based on the evidence I've seen now. However, <laughs> with that being said, uh, do I think that Hillary Clinton would rule out a run in 2020 entirely? No. Don't. I really don't. Now, it would be absolutely absurd for her to challenge someone who she lost to. Uh, she is. She was already uh, politically damaged when she entered the race in 2015. And to do that again, I mean, I would just feel bad for her. I wouldn't even be mad. I would just feel bad for her and think, wow, this is someone who, uh, who really just can't accept the fact that the American people aren't into her. You know, they don't want her to be president. We don't trust her. So, you know, right now we can't say that there's any validity to this rumor. And I wanted to discuss this because I think that it's starting to gain a little bit of momentum, but it's not true. You know, but again, I, I really couldn't see Hillary Clinton not at least contemplating it. Now, will she run? Probably not. Is she going to rule it out entirely? I don't think so, because if you're that narcissistic, I think that in her mind, she thinks if she just tweaked her campaign a little bit and campaigned more in the Rust Belt states, then maybe she could actually win because she, you know, started going after red states and tried to flip them. She got so overconfident. So I think that if she is thinking about this in terms of just looking at where she lost, you know, in the Rust, Rust Belt specifically, she's probably thinking, maybe I can actually win. Hillary. I'll just say this now. Give it up. Just give it up. Okay. The American people rejected you not once, but twice. And to be rejected a third time is just embarrassing. At this point, there's no reason to believe that this rumor is true. But I just hope that Hillary Clinton doesn't choose to run because that would be a catastrophe. However, with the degree to which Democrats and the establishment has showed how incompetent they are, I wouldn't be surprised if they uh, not only encouraged it, but supported her third bid for the presidency just because they're so dim-witted. So, look, Hillary, please just save us all the hassle of not trying to defeat you now for a third time and just don't run. Just retire. Enjoy your life. You're, you're filthy rich. You have lovely grandchildren and, you know, a lovely family. Just spend time with them. You can do anything you want. You could really be a true progressive now because you're not bound by money. So speak out on behalf of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Become a real activist. You can, the world is yours, right? So do something like that. Don't run for president again, Hillary, please. So I am here with a man with the best Ted Cruz impersonation and possibly the best Bernie Sanders impersonation on the internet, Kyle Kulinski, host of Secular Talk Radio. Uh, Kyle, how's it going, man? Thanks, Mike. Me. 
I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Thank you for being here. I'm very excited. Now, also, congrats on the new studio. It looks great, and I know you're uh, filming in your new office right now, right? Yes, sir. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. It's funny because we, uh, just before I, you know, we came on here and we're talking, somebody uh, said something to me on Twitter, like, um, I tried to donate to your studio, and it's not working. And I'm like, wait, what? So I go and I look at it. It was like four or five days or something like that since the last donation. It turns out, like with GoFundMe, if you do a, a fundraiser longer than a month, it like requires you to withdraw a little bit or something. So anyway, long story short, we, we're doing this fundraiser, and now randomly like smack dab in the middle of it for like four or five days, nobody was able to donate. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, well, that's – sorry. I mean, it, look, man, I'm already fucking ecstatic because – of how like above and beyond we've gone like in the first day it raised a ridiculous amount of money so i was floored by the support but it really is just funny that like in the middle of this fundraiser which i was <laughs> which i was like really excited about and pushing it's just like yeah it just isn't gonna work like halfway through but other than that it's going great <laughs> <laughs> that sucks and that is kind of like a good thing to know in the future if i ever do any gofundmes because i had no idea either the same thing would happen to me but no that was great yeah. that you know you raised so much that quickly and i think it speaks to just how good of a job you've been doing because I, I feel like more so than the overwhelming majority of political commentators you kind of have your finger on the pulse which is why i was excited to get your opinion because like i i still i know this might be beating a dead horse but i kind of wanted to talk about hillary clinton and just how shitty of a campaign she ran because i feel like if we don't address this and if democrats really don't know how shitty of a campaign that she ran then i feel like it's going to happen again and again yeah so, yeah. I mean, what, um, what was your take overall? I know you kind of talk about this a little bit on your show, but can you just give me an overall, is it is it the case that Hillary Clinton ran the worst campaign ever, in your opinion? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the only, the only evidence against that is maybe just that she won the popular vote. So, okay, but you still lost. Like, you... you you are you knew the rules of the game going into it, and you knew that like winning the popular vote isn't enough. You knew which states you had to pick off. You knew which states you had to hold. And like just the fact that she didn't campaign in Wisconsin and the fact that she basically took the Rust Belt for granted and just decided, like, oh, that was a Democratic firewall last time. They came out for Obama, so obviously they'll come out for me. It just shows the hubris and the entitlement of her campaign. And, I mean, it really is – God, I would have taken – taken our chances with Martin O'Malley over Hillary Clinton and Martin O'Malley like I don't think he said a sincere thing in his life I think when when he asked his wife to to marry her she was like are are you acting or are, is this real because he's just so fake and so plastic he's like our side's Marco Rubio but I would have taken him because he didn't have the tremendous amount of baggage that she had I mean the Clinton Foundation like even even here's the thing even the the scandals that aren't real like Benghazi like, there's there's so much smoke there that any reasonable person is going to go, well, maybe there's a fire. <laughs> so, right. so it's like she had a, a track record of just scandal after scandal, and, and a lot of this stuff is true, some of it not true. And it, it, she's just the wrong candidate. She's a 1990s candidate running at a time when, I mean, the type of politician that really had the heart of this election was like a Donald Trump and a Bernie Sanders. Right, right. And what's weird about Hillary Clinton is that she's still like, it's really weird when I hear her reasoning as to why she thinks she lost. She explains, you know, it was James Comey. It was everyone else but me. It was sexism. You know, it was Bernie bros and whatnot. But one thing that she just can't acknowledge is she fucked over her own base. Not only was she politically damaged because she already lost. I mean, we made fun of Mitt Romney uh, when he was trying to get back into the race potentially in 2016. But I mean, you lost in 2008. We rejected you once. You were damaged. And then you, I mean, you had to walk on eggshells already because of that. And you fucked over the base with hubris and you still can't acknowledge it. Nobody can acknowledge it. And I feel like that's one of the most frustrating things ever to me. Well, classic... Democratic failure is always ignore your base. So the Republicans, if you notice, they never do that. There's always right. something there for the. I mean, look, look at Trump picking Mike Pence for VP. That is nothing but a giant olive branch to the base to say, okay, all you idiots who supported Ted Cruz, like, okay, now you can come on board with me. I know me and Ted went at it, but here I'm picking like the most anti gay governor in the country with a track record of being super far right wing. And who did Hillary Clinton pick? 
fucking Tim Kaine, who's basically Mike Pence light. I mean, this guy is pro TPP. This guy is known like he's hailed as a moderate and a centrist. And obviously the, the campaign talk behind closed doors was, well, I mean, look, Hillary's a woman, so we don't want to go too far out there with the, you know, with minorities. And so don't, you know, don't pick a black person. Don't pick another woman. Don't go Elizabeth Warren. I mean, come on, that'd be crazy. Go with uh, to go with a white male. Go with the world's most boring white male. Go with that behind Jeb Bush. He's the only Tim Kaine's the only guy behind Jeb Bush. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, so they went. So it was a giant middle finger to the base. And the thing is, all the signs were there. Like your base already really, really doesn't like you. All the Bernie voters. I mean, we we looked at her like, uh, I mean, come on, you're basically a Republican. Like, what are you doing here? And well, you know, with her statements of I'm a centrist, guilty, guilty of being a centrist and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So like if you if she did, there's so many things she could have done to actually win this election. One of the main things was if you actually picked a progressive VP. Right. Because because it's like people I, people like me, it's like I was I was looking for reasons to go, OK, come on, give me something. Give me something, Hillary. Give me something. <laughs> And we just got slapped in the face at every fucking turn. Speeches with neocons in the general election, picking Tim Kaine. I mean, even she, I mean, what did she only adopt like two or three of Bernie's proposals? And it was so obvious, just like putting a bandaid over it and just saying, you know, adding it in the platform, basically like, oh, yeah, I like his education plan. We're going to adapt a part of that anyway, moving on and then, you know, go on to say more right wing stuff. So. Uh, if she picked Elizabeth Warren, I think she would have had a better chance of winning the election. If she picked any progressive VP, she would have had a better chance of winning the election. I could think of like 800 things that she could have done that would have actually made a difference. It, on, only on the issue, if she were to, in every speech, make an effort to talk about how she's against TPP now and make people believe it, if she did what Trump did on TPP, you just go out there and just rail against it every speech, I think she could have won the election. Right. But, you know, they, they underestimated Trump's populism and they underestimated how much, uh, you know, 9% of Democrats voted for Trump. So it shows you it's not just this idea of he's racist, he's, you know, and people who vote for him are deplorable, and that's the end of the conversation. Right. And, you know, when you say 9% of Democrats voted for Donald Trump, with that fact in mind, how in the hell are people blaming Jill Stein and Gary Johnson supporters? Jill Stein barely got 1% of the vote. Gary Johnson got in about 3% of the vote. But yet people flipped and supported Donald Trump. And this is what happened in 2000 as well. There were hundreds of thousands of Democratic voters, registered Democrats, that literally voted for George Bush and still people blame Ralph Nader. It's like Democrats focus on all the wrong things. And to kind of go back to what you were saying about Hillary Clinton, she was disingenuous to the nth degree. And she made so many rookie mistakes that I was like pulling my hair out. I mean, some of this was common sense that she was missing. And what one thing that you said uh, kind of made me think a little bit about how when she was campaigning with Bernie Sanders, she had, I don't know if you saw the video of her, there was like this background that said free college education or whatever with Bernie Sanders. And it looked like Bernie Sanders was fucking being held hostage trying to, you know, stump yeah. for Hillary Clinton. She only talked about that once she realized that a third of millennial voters were flipping and going to Gary Johnson and Jill Stein. Exactly. Exactly. So she saw, yeah, there was a poll that came out that had like alarming numbers of millennials she lost some ridiculous percentage of millennials in like one month and then she's like oh my god what do i do what do i do what do i do and then they're like i, I don't know be bernie sanders like you take one or two of his policies and then go out there and say that but remember the rest of her millennial outreach it was just the most cringe inducing bullshit i've ever seen i'm just chilling in cedar rapids and it go, a lot of that i think is because back when clinton won bill clinton like he he went on like Arsenio Hall show and played the fucking saxophone <laughs> and like back then that was viewed as like oh he's a cool politician because back then no politician ever tried to like you know uh, give an olive branch to pop culture if you will mm -hmm. so but since Bill Clinton every president has been like look at Obama I mean how many times has he been on fucking Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon and all these people he was even on the Daily Show once like mm -hmm. or a few times actually so like. Hillary was going off that old model of like, I must be hip and with it, and I must do the Macarena and talk about Pokemon. I don't know who created Pokemon Go. 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 Pokem
And it like now we're at a time where that era's dead and gone. Again, she's acting like it's 1992, and that's how you're supposed to run a campaign. Meanwhile, what did Bernie Sanders show? What did what did Donald Trump show? The the style of politician that's like super scripted and really robotic. We just we don't like that anymore. People don't like this. You know, I'm classy and above the fray kind of approach anymore because it smells really fake because it is Mm -hmm. so what they want is somebody like bernie or somebody like trump who even if they're not like in the case of trump he's usually not keeping it real he's a fucking chronic liar but the way he talks people go oh i think that guy's a straight shooter it's kind of like with chris christie when he talks oh i guess he's a straight shooter because he fucking yells at people like that's the thing is you you need that with Bernie fucking not combing his hair and being a really old guy who talks with his hands up and, <laughs> and he gets really into it, like, that's what people want. They want to look at you and go, okay, that's a real person. And uh, honestly, I think a lot of that has to do with the evolution of the internet and how now, you know, shows like ours, we get people who watch us and it's just a whole new way of delivering information. It's not the, the bullshit you know, news anchor wearing a suit and tie and having the perfect posture and talking in that standard voice that people have in both Sacramento and Tallahassee with the same (laughs) rhythm and cadence. So people are just sick of that, and they want to move away from it. And Hillary Clinton was like the last representative of that dying generation. But now we have to wait and see if the Democrats will make the mistake that it looks like they're going to make, which is try to put another person like that, you know, to run in 2020. Yeah, and from the looks of it, 2020 is looking a lot like 2008, because I don't know if you've been keeping up with who's kind of contacting donors, Kirsten Gillibrand, who is basically Hillary Clinton's mini-me, and then you yep. have Cory Booker, who's Obama Jr., it seems like they're both gearing up. And something about Kirsten Gillibrand is really, it just annoys me. One, she looks like she enjoys the smell of her own farts. She just gives me that vibe. And two, I kind of feel like she really discredited herself even more. I mean, we all knew she was a Wall Street shill. But she, I, I, like, we don't have the details of it, but there's an article, I think, in Politico that talked about how she rail, like, just railed against Bernie Sanders when he returned to the Senate because he didn't drop out fast enough and endorse Hillary Clinton. Not only that, so I think when she first ran, I think I voted for her when she was, like, running for the first time. Um, but then, yeah, the, I noticed during the campaign, during the primary she made one of the hackiest Bernie, anti-Bernie Sanders arguments I've ever heard. She said something along the lines of, oh, he can't, he can't sympathize. He's unable to sympathize with you know, the mothers of people who were killed by, with gun violence. Oh, right. So, yeah, and, and it was, this was in the midst of Hillary using like, shitty arguments against Bernie because Bernie only has like a D rating from the NRA and not an F. <laughs> And they're like, oh, Bernie, you don't want to allow people to sue gun manufacturers uh, unless there's negligence. So, you know, it's like the car thing. Like if, if, if uh, I used to be a car salesman. So it's like if I sold somebody a car and then, you know, like six years later, the person snaps and runs over people and kills them. Should that person be allowed to sue the car dealership? <laughs> and right. sue the car it's like, what? They didn't. What are you talking about? Like, they, how the fuck were they supposed to know? Yeah. So Bernie has the same position on guns. And they made it seem like he's fucking, you know, he, he, He's Liam Neeson in, in uh, Taken or some shit. Like he's going around shooting people. They're like, "Oh, Bernie, you don't you don't sympathize with people." Meanwhile, Bernie, you know, uh, Hillary and him agree on the basics. Like, mm-hmm. okay, you know, do universal background checks, do high capacity magazine ban, yada yada. So it's like it's just they were su- there were such hack arguments used against him, and it's so obvious that it was a concerted effort by the establishment to take down an actual liberal who wanted to do shit for the people and not for the corporations. That, you know, I, I, I certainly had the experience in this election of just losing a lot of respect for a lot of people who I formerly thought, you know, they're not that bad. No. Right. To steal from Trump, wrong. I was wrong. <laughs> sad. And, like, sad. Pathetic. 50% of the people, you know, in the Democratic Party, you look at them and you're like, oh, so when I thought you were reasonable, you were just like – like playing a role, like playing for a team. Mm-hmm. So like when you would say stuff about, yay, let's raise the minimum wage and do this stuff, you're only saying that because you're on a team as opposed to, you know, people who were fans of Bernie Sanders. You get the sense they wanted that because they're like, no, this is how you help people and fucking mm-hmm. make like the world a better place as right. opposed to hack, you know, Hillary Clinton fans who are just kind of accidentally 
on the ro- on the half correct team. <laughs> right. And and you could tell that, you know, they they didn't really look into the details. They were playing team democrat kind of as you were saying because you know, it's inconvenient to kind of really dive into the facts. It's difficult to figure out what a candidate is really about. So you have people like, that was a great point, by the way, about you just losing respect for people. I mean, I can name so many people that I just, I can't fucking stand. Like uh, now, Sarah Silverman, I used to like her prior to the selection. I can't stand her now. Bill Maher, I mean, I still like him, but he lost so much credibility in my eyes. And then even Louis C.K., who he literally said that, not only is he voting for Hillary Clinton, but she's like, the best. She's his yeah, first choice. Yeah, I take choice. her over anybody. That's what he said. I take her over anybody. I yeah. look, and I don't know to what extent, like the I, the Louis C.K. thing that he said about Conan. I covered that too, and it was like, I don't know to what extent he's joking and to what extent he's serious. But yeah, like when you hear people say shit like that, you just like Amy Schumer was probably the worst offender. Oh, I mean, yeah. Sarah Silverman is still like fantastic compared to Amy Schumer. Right, Amy that's Schumer true. with her arguments. I mean, it was just face palm after face palm. Like mm-hmm. she, she. What did she say? Something like, you know, um, you're if uninformed you're a, if you don't like Hillary. That's yeah, exactly. What she yeah, you're uninformed if you don't like Hillary Clinton. Like, <laughs> I did a, a long segment. Like, what? Let me give you all <laughs> real reasons why it's perfectly rational to dislike Hillary Clinton. So I don't know. That kind of smug. It, it, well, this was like the uh, the Hollywood establishment lining up o- alongside Hillary Clinton along with the financial establishment. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing that is just insufferable because it was so fake. And notice, they weren't able to to, to, to come through for her. I mean, mm-hmm. she had that huge fucking concert like the night of the election, the night before the election or some shit, right? It was right. like fucking Bruce Springsteen's there and Obama's giving a speech and there's a zillion people out in the open. And it's like, it, you know, it had this sense. They thought it had this sense of like inevitability and like mm-hmm. the glorious victory that's coming tomorrow. But if you're outside of that establishment democratic bubble, like we are, we just look at it and we go, oh, you're doing like a fucking insufferable, unbearable coronation of like <laughs> your handpicked oligarchy candidate. And we're sick of it. Yeah. Like, it, you know, it, it's the McFeminism thing. Yep. So for people who don't know what that is, I, I got that term from a guy named Adam Johnson who writes for Alternet and, and uh, FAIR. And he had gotten it from somebody else, but so I've been using it. Mick feminism is this idea that like you use feminism as a shield to like, in Hillary's case, be just an establishment asshole. <laughs> like <laughs> you do corporatist policies and you're like a right wing Democrat. But since you're a woman, you get to say, oh, you disagree with me? Well, I guess you're you're sexist, just like what they did to Bernie Sanders supporters. So it's like it's this. Not only is there McFeminism, now there's also McLiberalism. Mm-hmm. The idea of like, oh, pop culture, they love Hillary Clinton, and so therefore, you know, if you're not with her, you're a bad person or you're not liberal. It's mm-hmm. like, well, no, actually, you guys are the ones who aren't liberal because if you supported her over a candidate who, you know, really cared about the issues and has a decades long track record of fighting for them, as opposed to Hillary when you did get into her record. I mean, it's fucking support for NAFTA, voting for the Patriot Act, voting for the Iraq War. So it, it's the exact opposite. Like, they would say to us, oh, you're not the real liberals. No, but if you go by the issues, you're not the real liberals. You're just hopping on board this feeling of inevitability with this corporate shitty candidate who has a, you know, a D by her name. So you feel like it's got to be the right one. Right. I mean, if you compare Hillary Clinton to, like, Theresa May, for example, in the U.K., like, there's not much difference there. And she's in the conservative party. So, I mean, we're the ones who are the true liberals because we're actually looking at the policy substance and we're not just, like you said, looking at the D. And it's so it's so frustrating. And they really, I mean, I feel like Hillary Clinton supporters in many ways, not to, you know, uh, talk shit about the base, but they were worse than Donald Trump supporters because they not only failed to see what happened during the primaries with Bernie Sanders and whatnot and said we were conspiratorial, which is funny now because, you know, now they're looking at the integrity of the election, too. But, uh, you know, they just they won and then they kind of like threw it in our face. And I kind of feel like the Democratic establishment did that, too. And Hillary Clinton did that as well. So, I mean, th- this election really it is all about hubris. And, you know, one one person, you, you know, kind of on the subject of people who fell out of favor with us. I wanted to get your take on Elizabeth Warren because I'm lukewarm on her now. I mean, before the election, I loved her and I'd, I'd still probably vote for her in 2020. But I mean, she gave this speech about uh, how Democrats need to grow a spine now that the election is over. Meanwhile, she's been completely silent on the Dakota Access Pipeline. It's like, 
Elizabeth, you're saying the right words, but you have to actually walk the walk. And what are your thoughts on Elizabeth Warren? Because I feel like maybe I'm just a little bit overly butthurt still about not endorsing Bernie, but I don't know, man. So uh, if you were to ask me this before this election, I had Elizabeth Warren in the exact same category that I had Bernie Sanders, where, you know, both super progressive, you know, always do the right thing. So she was in the A plus category for me. After this election, she's no Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean it just it is what it is. She's not Bernie Sanders. I know, and I know by the way, a lot of people would even disagree with me on this, and they'd say, well, Bernie eventually endorsed, endorsed Hillary, so Bernie Sanders is no Bernie Sanders. No, nah, on that I disagree. I think he really just made a sheer lesser of two evils calculation. I don't mm -hmm. view him as some sort of sellout. People who wanted him to run with Jill Stein. I don't think they get that the math would simply make it so Donald Trump is guaranteed to win if they right. did that. And he just didn't want Donald Trump to be president for understandable reasons. Um, so I don't think I don't think she's Bernie Sanders anymore. She's just uh, she's just as good as you can get of an establishment Democrat. So she's like right. the better wing of the establishment Democrats. And. You know, it's kind of, there's, you know what it is, man? It's just there's so many shades of gray and it's this giant spectrum. Mm -hmm. So if Hillary Clinton is like one of the worst Democrats, and actually that's not even fair because there are blue dog Democrats mm -hmm. that are worse than her. Like Evan Bayh is worse than Hillary Clinton. Um, who else? Joe Manchin, I think, is worse. Yeah. Wor oh, he's terrible. Yeah, so there, so like there's all these, these gradations of Democrats. And if Joe Manchin and Evan Bayh are the worst, then one level, one step slightly better than them is Hillary Clinton. And then I have Obama somewhere between Hillary Clinton and like Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. And then Bernie Sanders and Alan Grayson, they would be more on the end of the spectrum of even better than Elizabeth Warren. So overall, you know, she's still done so many great things. Uh, you can nobody could ever take away from her the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Right. The fact that. She fought tooth and nail to get the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau passed. She basically forced Obama to get it passed. And so you can't take that away from her, and you can't take away the, the actual progressive things that she did. And I still think, broadly speaking, she's on the right side of most issues. But obviously it just sucks, and it's really concerning, and it's really annoying that, number one, she didn't endorse Bernie. Mm -hmm. And number two, she's silent on some important issues like the Dakota Access Pipeline. So, but I, but I guess the overall point I'm trying to make is, um, there's so many shades of gray that I don't think it's fair to just categorize as like sell out or not sell out. You know what I mean? Right. Like I right. think it's, I think it's there's like nuance. There's a shitload of nuance among the Democrats, and it, it, they range from just as bad as the Republicans to like mm -hmm. Evan Bayh and fucking Joe Manchin. <laughs> to almost as bad, maybe like 0.8% better Hillary Clinton. And then, you know, the Obama types and then Elizabeth Warren and then Bernie. So there's a huge spectrum. I, you know, my feelings are similar to yours. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of mixed on her after the whole Bernie episode. And you just kind of hope that the reason she did what she did was, you know, some sort of strategy. Because mm -hmm. in, I think my guess would be in her heart of hearts, she did support Bernie over Hillary, which is why... She was the only female in the Senate, or I think it might have even been the only female Democrat in all of Congress who didn't endorse Hillary Clinton during right. the primary. So, like, she held back there because I think that's a sign of, like, I don't really want Bernie to win. Then waited until it, she basically thought it's totally over now and then endorsed Hillary Clinton. So you th you'd hope she's, like, making that her true feelings are pro-Bernie and she made sort of a calculation there. So that she could maybe have some sway over the Hillary Clinton administration if Hillary were to win. I mean, that's hmm. the best case scenario, and that's what you hope. That's what I lean to think maybe she did. But either way, it, you know, it, it's a mixed picture, and she's no longer an A plus Democrat. She's more of a, a B plus Democrat. Right, right. And you know, she's one of many. I think that I, I used to love unequivocally, and now it's yeah. like, mm, you know, it, yeah. Now it's, it's like tough. okay. Now I gotta look at. Now I gotta watch everything that you do. But you know what? <laughs> it's even that. Even we're we're being a little too kind. Even because I remember even when I had her in like the category with the best Democrats, her she said some shit about when uh, Israel was bombing the living fuck out of Gaza mm -hmm. in 2014 and just massacring civilians left and right. She had some horrific statement that was just like right. a Republican. 
He was like, Israel has a right to defend itself, and that's the end of the conversation. Yeah, Bernie so, said that too, actually, in yeah, 2014. Yeah, Bernie did too. So even, yeah. that's the thing, is even among these, like, there's, none of them are, you're never going to agree with them 100%. Right. And there are going to be some areas where you just scratch your head, and you're like, what the fuck did you just say? And this is normally somebody who you're like, oh, yay, I agree with them, and I'll support them. Mm. So that's politics, man, and it sucks. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you talk about Joe Manchin, what I don't remember what he said about punching. He said something about punching people in the face who burned the flag after Trump said that statement. But that made me think of Trump. And I wanted to you kind of alluded to this. But do you think that Donald Trump was kind of baiting the press by talking about flag burning? Because what he proposed was similar to what Hillary Clinton proposed. So I don't know if he's just kind of messing with people and saying, well, let's see if they take the bait. I think he believes it, but I think it's a coincidence that. Um, Hillary Clinton proposed uh, legislation to basically <laughs> ban flag burning in 2005. And it's funny because, it, you, again, like you see, like, what's her face? Anira Tandon said something on Twitter that was like, oh, right. And they like took Donald Trump's tweet and then tweeted above it. Like, oh, right. And Hillary Clinton and him are the same. Right. Oh, my God. It's like, you fucking idiot. Oh. Do you know nothing about Hillary when you worked for her since 1723? Like, she proposed legislation to ban it. So, no, I don't think I don't think that that was his goal. I don't think he's playing chess and he's that smart. And he's like, "Ooh, I'm going to bait liberals into hypocrisy. I just think he's uh, an impulsive guy. And there was a story recently about how on a college campus, some liberals like took down the flag and then burned the flag after he won. Mm. And so this was him. This was him like kind of lashing out at that and saying, oh, there should be punishment for this. But, you know, the stuff like that. You get the sense that Hillary, she was doing that sheerly for, like, political reasons back then. You right. know what I mean? In 2005. Because, mm-hmm. I don't know, I guess there was some story that involved that. And she was like, I'm going to be bipartisan now and go on the side Ugh. of the Republicans. But, like, you don't get the sense that if she were president today, she would be saying, let's fucking, <laughs> let's punish people for burning the American flag. But, yeah, right. no, I am scared of his authoritarian impulse. I am. Because right. he's, um, you know, he's demonstrated it time and time again that. He's willing to actually take the the steps once he has those like childish emotions of retribution, mm-hmm. and, like with the whole suing the onion and suing Bill Maher over jokes. Right. It's like that's you're a fucking man child. How can you do that? Now he's president. Yeah, he he's the most triggered president in U.S. history, and I think you make a phenomenal point. You're really the first person who I heard make this argument besides T.J., uh, the amazing atheist, about right wing SJWs. Yes. Like, they rail against political correctness, but they're just as easily triggered. I mean, all the people who talk about uh, people getting offended uh, if you, you know, say something that's too politically incorrect, they're the same people who would lose their shit if you make fun of Jesus. The exactly. same people. And it, it's just yeah. so frustrating, the hypocrisy and whatnot. Um, so I think that that's something that... Do you? Well, let me ask you this. Do you think that the right will kind of at least his base anyways, kind of lose favor with Donald Trump when it comes to... Because he's already kind of gone back on some of his promises. How long do you think, if it is going to happen, that they'll actually realize, oh shit, we were conned? I don't think it's going to happen. I think that the same thing is going to happen um, that happened with Ronald Reagan and the same thing is going to happen that uh, happened with George W. Bush, which is for conservatives, for many conservatives, I should say, they really are at their core. There's a streak of authoritarianism. So, and it's not just in the U S it's the world over. Mm -hmm. So when they pick a leader, they now view it as, and this happens on the left too, but I think to a slightly lesser degree, but they view it as like, okay, now we have to, now we have to play defense for our guy who's in there. So no matter what he does, I mean, there's like Ann Coulter, just to give one example, you know, I saw her earlier today tweeting about, uh, like trade deals and, now, all of a sudden, Ann Coulter is, you know, massively protectionist and against trade deals. <laughs> Meanwhile, under George W. Bush, when he was pushing for them, she was the most in favor of them you could possibly be. Hannity, mm-hmm. the same thing. Like, Hannity was in, during the Bush years, if Bush pushes for them, oh, I love trade deals, they're great. If you're against them, you're un-American. Now that Donald Trump is, uh, in at least in rhetoric against them, you know, all of a sudden, he's like, oh, me? I fucking never like trade deals. I don't know what you guys <laughs> are talking about. He did it with the NSA, too. The NSA under Bush, spying on everybody. He says, oh, you know, you're unpatriotic if you're against this, and this is to protect the homeland. And then, obviously, under Obama, he doesn't dismantle it. He puts it on steroids. And then all of a sudden now, the same programs, he's like, oh, this is an unconstitutional overreach. So I think that whatever Trump does, they're going to go, okay, you know what? 
it is what it is. He's our leader, and now let's defend it. Even to the point where, I don't know if you remember, but right after the election, he did an interview, I think, with 60 Minutes. And in it, he said something along the lines of, look, the Supreme Court ruled on gay marriage. I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, evangelicals voted for him in gigantic numbers. Even in the primaries, he right, that's weird. beat Cruz with the evangelicals. And Cruz wakes up in the morning and beats off to Jesus. <laughs> so this is, me. I mean, <laughs> me, I'm Ted Cruz, me. Um, so, yeah, the, he could say anything, and then his his people will defend. Mm -hmm. So uh, now we're on team Republican. He's the leader of the Republicans. Now we're going to defend. So right. and look, there there are some accidental upsides to that, you know. So if he does happen to do more protectionist policies and kill the TPP, mm -hmm. okay, great. You know, hey, I'm happy you killed the TPP. And sure. If you want your cackling, idiot, brainless followers to all of a sudden jump on the anti-TPP bandwagon, fine. It makes my fight against it easier because, you know, I don't have to convince them. They're on our side now, so I have to just convince the establishment Republicans and the establishment Democrats that it's wrong. So there's some uh, unintended upsides of that. But overall, yeah, I think they're, they're just going to defend him. Right. And and to be fair to Trump's people, I, I saw a lot of this on the left, too, with Hillary Clinton. Like, you had Hillary Clinton people defending the Iraq war. Like, I don't know who it was. It was one of the hosts of The View, uh, and Jimmy Dore talked about this, how she was talking to someone, maybe it was Bernie Sanders himself, about the Iraq war. And she, she was one of the most outspoken people in 2008 against McCain and whatnot for supporting it. And she was like, well, isn't it done? Should we give her a pass for it now? I mean, isn't that... You know, spoiled milk. Yeah, yeah, that's it's probably just... Joy Behar. Maybe Whoopi oh, said right, that. I don't know. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I think it's, you're right. It's um, yeah, I hate that. I fucking despise it. And mm -hmm. yeah, that does happen on the left too, for sure. Definitely with those Hillary people, because like we were talking about earlier, they they kind of expose themselves as not really caring too much about the issues, and just kind of having a, a personality cult. But I noticed right. that during the election too, when it came to the. Ironically, people screamed at Bernie supporters saying, you know, we are in a personality cult. What? Yeah. Hillary, first of all, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump have been on all sides of all issues. You could find <laughs> them saying anything about any fucking policy ever, any yep. issue. Bernie's been saying the same thing for decades. Mm -hmm. So it, it's quite the opposite. Bernie supporters, while they fervently love Bernie, of course— they do it because he actually stands for something coherent and consistent and mm -hmm. something that would help the American people and make our country a thriving social democracy. Whereas, if think about it. If you are a big-time supporter of Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, you literally cannot be doing it based off of policy. Because I just mm -hmm. told you, they've been on every side of every policy issue. So what are you doing it based off of? It's got to be something else. It's right. got to be, I don't know, I like the way they talk, I like the way they act, I like... I don't she's know, they just woman. represent something. He's right, that she's a woman. establishment. Yeah, exactly. So it's quite the opposite. I found that their supporters were very cultish. And remember, only 9% of the American people chose them in the primaries. 9%. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's abysmally low. Right. And that show, I mean, that's an argument right there. I'm not a big fan of mandatory anything, but when I read those numbers, I thought, you know what? Maybe we do go the same route that a lot of other uh, modern nations have it, mandatory yeah. voting. Australia you know, does. Exactly. Just like yeah. we have, um, you know, like jury duty, like, oh, you got to go to jury duty, mm -hmm. you know, like why would voting not be one of those things? Right, right. No, I'm, I'm with you on that, actually. I This was really the first election where I really started to consider, you know, maybe I am in favor of compulsory voting after all, because yeah. I mean, w what else can we do at this point when you have turnout so low? That's just bad for democracy, generally oh, speaking, of totally. you know, because I mean, you're a political science guy, you know, that it, when people check out, you know, that's that's bad news. But yeah. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but one last thing I wanted to get your opinion on was, and, and there's really no right or wrong question because we don't have, uh, or answer because we don't have all the information. Do you think that Donald Trump can actually be perceived as a successful president? Because he has Congress on his side, uh, and I this is what I fear. I fear that if he's able to be efficient and actually pass a lot of policies, you know, if we're anticipating that Democrats will just roll over and die— do you think that the American people will kind of look at him as just doing things and think, well, you know, Congress wasn't functioning and now things are getting done. I don't know if they're good or bad, but they're getting done. Do you think that can help him and kind of make him look as though he's a Ronald Reagan type figure? If you held a gun to my head today and said, Kyle, you need to tell me right now, will Donald Trump get reelected or not? 
Now, obviously, I'm doing this right after he got elected the first time. So it's super limited information. There's a million and one things that are going to happen in the next four years. Right. So this is as, as you know, as uneducated a guess as you can get, because the limited information we have now is going to be obsolete in a little bit. Right. Totally. But if you held a gun to my head today and said, is he more likely to get reelection or not? I would say he's more likely to win reelection mm -hmm. because the Democratic Party is in shambles and he's going to do what he did uh, that I covered today and he did uh, this week, which is like the carrier deal, how he cut a deal and the details of the deal are not good, to be clear, because no. it's like corporate welfare and all that shit and deregulation. But he cut a deal and he said, OK, carrier, you're keeping at least some of your jobs in this country and they're not going to Mexico. And then he did a press conference where he fucking bragged endlessly. Mm -hmm. And that is brilliant politics. And it's something that the Democrats never do. When Obama increased uh, the overtime, uh, the amount of people that get overtime, he didn't brag about it. When mm -hmm. he got the Cuba deal and then Cuba subsequently legalized small businesses, he didn't brag about it. When he got the Iran deal and cut, cut off Iran's path to a nuke, he didn't brag about it. The list goes on and on. When he covered millions more people with Obamacare and everybody knows Obamacare is not my favorite, we need single payer. That's obviously what we need. But you could have went out there and said, hey, guess what? I saved lives because now if you have a pre-existing condition, they have to cover you. He right. could have bragged. He didn't do it. So when you don't do it, well, then you let, let the opposition define you and frame you and, and also lie about you. They could just lie and say shit that's not true. But since they're the ones who have the bully pulpit, you know, with Obamacare, that's another great example. The Republicans made the argument. People forget about this. There are death panels and they want to kill your grandma. <laughs> now, me and you look at that and we go, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. But what happens is a lot of people in the country, they listen to that and their response isn't, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Their response is, oh my goodness, that is such a strong claim and these people are so against Obamacare that something's got to be wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Because I don't even hear the counter argument from the Democrats saying, no, that's not true and we just saved X amount of lives. So the Republicans are good at framing the Republicans are good at arguing, and Donald Trump, any little victory he notches, and he will notch a bunch of little victories that he can spin as positive to the American people. He's going to go out there, he's going to brag, and he's going to use that bully pulpit more effectively than any other president. So my guess is that mixed with the fact that the Democratic Party is in shambles, as of right now, it's more likely he gets reelected. Re but... You know, obviously, I got to bite my tongue because there's so much more that goes into it. We could have a giant economic crash. In fact, I think one is coming. I just don't know when it's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and he can handle that in a disastrous way. And, you know, there's just a lot of things that can happen. But I don't know. I'm Even with, with Trump, I'm just hoping against all reason <laughs> that he somehow stands up against the worst picks that he made, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who says right. good people don't smoke marijuana, he's openly racist, Mike Pompeo for the CIA, who wants to fucking execute Edward Snowden. He said things that are more populist and more liberal than these jackasses he's picking. You just got to hope that the things he said that are good are going to be the things that he actually sticks to. But, mm -hmm. you know, with Donald Trump, you just never fucking know. And no. there's already been signs that are... Um, you know, in the opposite direction. But before I go real quick, I wanted to ask you about what did you think about um, the argument that, hey, maybe Donald Trump winning is actually better for the left as opposed to Hillary Clinton winning? I, I don't agree with it. Um, and I say that because typically what you see with voters is when they lose or something doesn't go their way, they tend to get demoralized. And you, you saw a lot of people like really amped up. I know I was fired up after Donald Trump won and whatnot, but typically it just is the case that, you know, if Donald Trump of all people could win, I think the average voter is going to look at that and think, you know, change is never possible. If he can win, then we're never going to get the policies that we want. But in terms of like uniting the left and whatnot, I feel as though that's not going to happen because you already see signs that the Democrats are going to roll over and die. I mean, Representative um, Elijah Cummings said that he's going to work with Trump where they have common ground. Now, you hear that, and at face value, it's reasonable, right? But what that really means, if history, you know, it repeats itself, is that Democrats are going to give Republicans everything that they want. Like, I mean, in the 90s, uh, Bill Clinton signed Republican welfare into law. He signed NAFTA into law. 
They gave George Bush everything. I think one of the few things that they fought against George Bush on was when he tried to partially privatize Social Security. So I feel like, you know, maybe uniting the base in a way after eight years, if Democrats can get their shit together, it'll be good because we kind of seem to alternate every eight years between a Republican and a Democrat. And we'll just be sick of, you know, a Republican. Maybe then, but in terms of just like this real big force or something kind of akin to the Tea Party but on the left... I want it to happen, but, you know, part of me thinks that it probably won't. So I don't know that I agree with that. Are you- yeah, well, we're going to try to bring that about. But I, uh, to your broader point, I agree with it because um, I, kind of, I kind of agree with Noam Chomsky on this. And Noam Chomsky made the point that, you, first of all, it's going to be a struggle to mobilize either way. Like mobilizing is a fucking pain in the ass, and it's going to mm-hmm. be hard to mobilize either way. But you would rather be mobilizing against somebody who at least – partially somewhat is receptive to what you're saying as opposed to somebody who on many fronts is actively trying to go in the wrong direction and go way in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, basically Chomsky said with Trump, you're going to be fighting to hold on to some basic things that you wouldn't have had to fight to hold on to otherwise. Like, for example, when he wants to have nationwide stop and frisk, which is massively discriminatory and over 90 percent of the people that they stop – they get nothing, and it disproportionately cracks down on minority communities. You know, you talk about something like that. You talk about what he wants to do with undocumented immigrants, how he would go much further than what even Obama wants to do, did, and what Hillary Clinton wanted to do. So, right. you're, it's, and you're also to. Sorry, I got to pivot back to the other point that you made, which is a point I've made on my show as well too. Which is, yeah, you're not. The Democrats are going to roll over either way. The elected Democrats. They rolled over under Reagan. They rolled over under George W. Bush. If there was ever going to be a time when they were going to stand up and fight, it was going to be when you had George W. Bush, this mm-hmm. massively unpopular president who did insane things. You know, you could have stood up and voted against the Iraq war and said, there's no evidence. And we already invaded Afghanistan, so we're fighting Al Qaeda. So you can't say we're weak on terror. There's no evidence. There's no evidence. There's no evidence. They didn't do that. They passed the Patriot Act. They rolled over for that. They rolled over for his tax cuts. The list goes on and on. So if they were ever going to fight, they were going to fight under George W. Bush, and the elected Democrats didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, that's all the evidence I need that now we're just at the whims of Trump, because if Trump decides to go in a a far right direction in many respects, and I fear he will, well, then the Democrats are going to roll over. So, you know, if you had somebody like Hillary, who's at best like Obama, at worst right of Obama— you still know that the the worst you're going to get is just right of Obama, as mm-hmm. opposed to with Donald Trump. There's this wild card angle where it's like, no, if he does like one tenth of the really bad things he said during the campaign, like you know, bring back torture, take right. out, out their families, kill you know uh, civilians in the Middle East on purpose, um, lower wages, all oh, wages are too high, uh, eliminate the FDA and the EPA. He's already looking like he's going to appoint people who are just not going to fucking enforce it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He's going to Rick Perry for the Department of Energy. He's going to sit around with his thumb up his ass, and that's going to be the entire fucking point. So, you know, you're just at the whims of Trump at that point. So, you know, I I Mm -hmm. kind of agreed more with Chomsky that the counterintuitive argument I never bought, like it's got to get as bad as humanly possible to get better. Well, then if that's that's your argument then, be consistent and just vote Trump. You know what I'm saying? Right, yeah, I don't agree with that. Yeah, like if you really believe that. So if you really believe Trump is better for the left... Vote Trump. <laughs> mm-hmm. And one then, thing... Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, no. Go no ahead. What I was going to say is one thing that I fear, and I hope that I'm wrong, I really hope I'm wrong, is that Democrats have displayed that they're so incompetent that if they see that Donald Trump was successful and if maybe his approval rating starts to increase, I have a feeling they might even move to the right again, kind of like they did in the 1990s after Reagan. Totally right. No, totally correct. Because that's the... They never learn the right lesson. So mm-hmm. if you, you we saw what was the reaction to Hillary's people when she lost? Oh, blame Comey, blame Jill Stein, blame Gary Johnson, blame sexism. So zero self-reflection. Well, guess what they're going to do? They're going to go back and they're going to look at what Hillary did in her campaign. And they're going to say, where did we deviate from the, the standard political textbook of like run to the right in the general election? So run to mm-hmm. the left in the primary, run to the right in the general election. They're going to say, oh, you know, they're going to pin it on the few things she did that were slightly more progressive than she would have done if Bernie wasn't in the race. And I've already seen articles about that. Mm -hmm. Time magazine. 
<laughs> yeah, her problem is that she followed Bernie to the left off a cliff. What the fuck are you talking about? Ugh. So they're going to take the exact wrong message. This is what happened in the midterms, too. Remember in the midterms? Alison Lundergan Grimes, who is basically a Republican who's a Democrat. And Mitch, that's not how you hold a gun. I'm Alison Lundergan Grimes. <laughs> Ran against Mitch McConnell, turtle boy who had an approval rating of <laughs> negative 3,002. And she lost. And she lost because... The American people went, okay, look, we might not like Mitch, but at least he's not like this weaselly character who's basically trying to say, I kind of agree with Mitch on everything, but I'm just a new face, so maybe vote for me. She was asked if she voted for Obama in a press conference. <laughs> she wouldn't fucking answer. She's a Democrat. She wouldn't say, yeah, of course I fucking voted for him. She yeah. wouldn't say it. So it was this fundamental weakness, and the Democrats always learn the lesson of, oh, the problem was she wasn't weak enough. She wasn't right-wing enough. She didn't agree with the Republicans enough. They never walk away going, oh, well, maybe the problem was we needed to go way further left. And they never look at the opinion polls and then figure that out either. How even Vox did a poll in the, in the primary, and they found that Bernie's agenda was super popular. Mm -hmm. Way more than if you fucking isolate what Ted Cruz believes or Hillary Clinton believes and do a poll. So he had so many people with him. I, Sorry, I'm getting I'm getting all worked up here. <laughs> no, you, no, I love it. You're right, though, it, and it's so frustrating. The and I covered a Time article, and uh, it which just reinforces this notion that we're talking about here. They called Bernie Sanders the Ralph Nader of 2016 because his presence was so devastating that he pushed Hillary Clinton so far to the left, to the left, even though she was courting neoconservatives, that she lost. She just wasn't electorally yeah. viable. Yeah, it it just makes my fucking head explode. I can't like I can't deal with the stupidity. Yeah, because the, it's like they're incapable of learning the the proper lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's like it's almost like, uh, with the Republicans where, they'll cut taxes and deregulate, and then the economy will crash, and then they'll <laughs> go, oh, I know the problem. We didn't cut taxes and deregulate enough. We needed to do it more. It's like no, 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 the exact opposite. You needed to do stimulus and you needed to regulate to make sure everything was okay. Right. So it's, it's it's one of those things where in their mind, our position is just um, – or excuse me, their position is non-falsifiable. Mm -hmm. So no matter what, the answer is go further right, cave more to the Republicans, and that's just a recipe for total and utter disaster and repeated loss. Right, or blame voters, blame Bernie bros and you know blame people who didn't get out to vote even though they weren't inspired by two historically disliked candidates. It, it's frustrating, and yeah, I feel like there's a strategy for winning. Blame the voters. Yeah, good one. Right, and and that was what I, what was weird is that even during the primary, you saw Bill Clinton attacking uh, Bernie Sanders supporters, saying, "Well, they they want to be so harsh on Wall Street. What what do they want? Do they want to you know set up a firing squad or something of that nature?" He said, "It's yeah. like, dude, what are you doing? You don't attack the base. You you can't attack the base. That's not." That's not acceptable. Yeah, and that's also just a massive straw man and a stupid fucking point. It's like, yeah. all we wanted were the fucking laws that exist to be upheld. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so they commit fraud. If you have somebody on Wall Street who commits fraud, you got to treat that guy the same way that if there was a small businessman who was caught doing fraud in a small town, and that person would go to fucking jail. Right. But the people on Wall Street got away with it because of their massive campaign contributions. Mm -hmm. And Bill Clinton is a fucking product of that system, so he doesn't see any evil. Right, right. And... Yeah, it's frustrating, but thankfully, there are people like you, you know, people like Young Turks and whatnot, who, when you listen to them, it's like therapeutic, like it, you know, it's kind of like venting. When I come on the air, I, I vent for my viewers, because I kind of feel like there's so much stupidity that if you don't, like, take a step back and reflect on it, it, it it's going to drive you crazy, and I kind of felt like I lost a little bit of my sanity during this election. I don't know if, you know, that's the yeah. same for you, too. No, yeah, no, it's, um... I certainly learned that I, like I said, I dislike many more people than I thought I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that I learned, but yeah, I think over you're you're nailing it about what what it is we do. Like mm -hmm. so, when I go on air and I'm talking about stuff, um, yeah, I guess in a weird way that's a form of therapy because it's me giving information about something that I think is fucked up, and then explaining just why it's fucked up and how it's so fucked up, and explaining that we should change it. And, uh, yeah, I guess it is – it gives you a little bit of a release, and it makes it so that, you know, people – what's that word I'm looking for? Is it catharsis? Is that the right word? People watch uh, it and they feel catharsis? I don't know. Don't make me look it up right now. <laughs> we'll, we'll go with we'll go with that. 
We'll go with catharsis, but that might not be. I was, uh, it was either. I'll be wrong it's not shot. It's not Schadenfreude. That's another one that is a word that's oh, slightly yeah, above yeah. my pay grade. Um, I think that's like getting pleasure out of somebody else's pain. Schadenfreude. But catharsis, huh. I think, is what people feel when they watch us. If it's the word I'm thinking of. <laughs> I'm fucking embarrassing myself because I'm a PhD student. I don't know. <laughs> I yeah, can't no. Think of- okay, but let me just say real quick, just in, in, some inside stuff, so people know what goes on here. Like. There are times when I'm doing the show and a word will just come out and I'm like, there's a 50% chance that word makes no sense where I just put it. <laughs> like, because sometimes, you know, it's a word that's deep in the memory bank and mm-hmm. like you've used it before a few times, but you're not sure if you're using it in the exact right context, but you're already too committed and it just comes out. Mm-hmm. And then you just got to run with it and say, you know what? Even if this shit is wrong, I'm going to say it's that you think it's right. <laughs> right. You just own it. You make words yeah. sound sometimes, but you know what? It, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, I think the viewers know what we mean. They can fill in the blanks. Yeah. And then also another thing that happens, you, you, I'm sure you've experienced this too when you uh, do live shows is it's a guarantee that every now and then you'll just lose a, a thought mid-sentence. Oh, yeah. And you're like, oh, okay. That happened to me like twice in this talk <laughs> so <laughs> it happens man it just happens it's it's part of, it's, it's par for the course when you uh when you talk about stuff like this and that's what makes us natural right because we're not reading from any teleprompters or like the news people who are just so rehearsed and robotic we're just saying what's on our minds it's it's unadulterated yeah, it's, it's the not beauty fake. of media you know it's right. not, i guess i guess the a good way to put it is some like some of the failures of new media even have beauty in it like because mm-hmm. at least at least you know you're getting something that's fucking genuine and sincere and real. Whereas if you're watching Wolf Blitzer read off a prompter, God, man, I always, oh. I always fucking go after Wolf Blitzer. But I think he deserves it. I He's think. an easy target. He's no, I really, target. but I really dislike him. Like, uh, you know, mm-hmm. this is the part where I'm supposed to say, oh, it's not personal. No, it is personal. Fuck you, Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> because you know what? This guy, I mean, he's been on TV since uh, 1806, mm-hmm. and he's still not famous. <laughs> like he's been on TV every day for that long, still not famous. And his whole like he's in the position he's in because he doesn't challenge authority. Mm-hmm. He's in that position because he's a stenographer to the establishment and to people in power. Mm-hmm. And it's not like he personally is a bad guy, but you're just a fucking tool and you don't know it. Like mm-hmm. I think he doesn't realize how much responsibility he actually has in doing what he does. I mean, he's on CNN more than anybody. He has more hours than anybody. And there's never an interesting thought, never, Mm-mm. never, even when they discuss facts and things that are actually happening, it's never the things that he should be covering. Well, I mean, no. let's go find out how many times has Wolf Blitzer covered the fucking, uh, you know, devastation from the airstrikes in Yemen from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is bombing the shit out of Yemen with weapons we gave them. And sometimes we point out the coordinates on the fucking map mm-hmm. and they're they're killing civilians on purpose. By some counts, 50% of the people uh, that they killed are civilians. It's mm-hmm. women, it's children. They've bombed, you know, fucking mosques and open-air markets and schools and hospitals. How many times has Wolf Blitzer discussed that? None, because he's yeah. a fucking little useful idiot for the establishment. He doesn't so, even know what's going on, I'm sure. I mean, he doesn't have to do research. He just reads everything from a script. Yeah, he's it, fucking it's Ron so Burgundy. He's Ron Burgundy. He <laughs> Burgundy will read anything off the prompter. And, you know, he just happens to, at least Ron Burgundy is somewhat entertaining. Wolf right. is just fucking boring as shit, and he's reading off the prompter, and it's never anything worth discussing. But you know what? I'm bitching. I shouldn't be bitching, because that's why new media is blowing up. That's, that's true. Why, yeah, that's why people like listening to shows like ours, and, you know, um, so Wolf keeps sucking. I appreciate yeah. it. And my, my Wolf Blitzer is Chris Matthews. He just, he says things with so much hubris that are wrong that... That it, it just makes my head explode. And he also has a punch face on top of that. I can say that because I have a punch face, I think, to a degree. But he he just has this unlikable personality. And he thinks he knows everything, but he doesn't. And I just, I hate that. But I'm glad that they do fuck up, like you said, because they do give us things to talk about and make fun of. And we'll we talk, can point out why they're wrong. Talk about a fall from grace. I mean, it, how about Maddow, who at one time was right. like seemingly a very real liberal who actually cared about shit. And then now... I mean, with Terrible. the fucking blame Jill Stein for everything ever, and just, just some of the interviews she did of Hillary Clinton were just disgusting. It was mm-hmm. in the middle of the primary when she should have been holding her accountable and saying, "Hey, 
you know, we let's compare and contrast you and Bernie. It was just fluff pieces and softballs to destroy Bernie Sanders. Yeah, just and, pure propaganda. Yeah, and the, the you know even the better host like there was a time when some of the better hosts on MSNBC I would have said are just good, but now even the better hosts are you know meh now like even Chris Hayes who overall mm-hmm. I think is a decent guy. He's ran with some shit that I'm like, really? Is that this road you're going down with the whole Russia thing and playing Donald Trump as a fucking puppet of Vladimir Putin? I, like, yeah. what? It, that's another thing. I mean, we don't need to get too into it, but I've been driven crazy. Like, I, you know, I follow a bunch of people on Twitter who are in the political world. Some of them, some writers for Think Progress, for example, who at times mm-hmm. did decent work. But there's this guy, Judd Legum, who, mm-hmm. like, he is just the quintessential hack partisan pundit mm-hmm. who never has anything good to say never has anything I- informative to say so he was going mm-hmm. after trump the other day like right when the deal was announced that carrier got to keep uh, is keeping the uh, some jobs here and we didn't even know any of the details yet all we knew was and carrier had confirmed it yeah we're gonna keep some jobs here he started attacking trump over that like <laughs> Wait, what? Like, no, I, I thought you're supposed to be a liberal and you're supposed to care about people. And you're supposed mm-hmm. to go, hey, you know what? Like, it, let's be reasonable. And, for example, let's say if Donald Trump happens to, I don't know, protect um, Social Security or do a good infrastructure bill. If that were to happen, you're supposed to be a, a, an objective person and go, OK, well, it appears like the details of this are good. Credit where credit is due. Mm-hmm. But these people don't do that. These people, He's they just never hack. They, exactly. They never use. There's so many good arguments to use against Trump, and they're too mm-hmm. stupid to figure out what the good arguments are. So they just mm-hmm. use shitty arguments, and they yeah. attack him for shit he does that actually might be good. And the yeah. carrier thing again, to be clear, it's a much more mixed picture. It, you no, know, you're right. It is. It, it is. Yeah, it is corporate welfare and deregulation is part of it, and he should have stuck to what he said in the campaign trail, which is, if you go, I'm gonna fucking put a tariff on you and make it cost more. Mm-hmm. you're going to stay and you're going to pay your taxes and I'm not going to deregulate you. That's how mm-hmm. he needed to do it. That's how he said he was going to do it. Now there's more corporate giveaways as part of it and deregulation. So it's not as good as it's supposed to be. Right. I get it. But still, you got to say, okay, he said he was going to keep the jobs here. He's keeping at least 800 of them here. Let me not be a douche and say, well, yeah. at least on that, you know what, thumbs up. And Judd Legum, he has no credibility. He was implicated in John Podesta's emails for yes, colluding right. with Hillary Clinton. I, give it, I don't know what he did. He might have given like an article. I covered it, but uh, it's been a little bit now. So, I mean, you have no credibility. The people who you were supposed to be uh, a check on, you were trying to do propaganda for them. So, I mean, it's just one of the many examples of how media and just the political establish- establishment failed us it, during and, this election. And he's also going on and on about Trump's business ties and conflicts of interest, which, by the way, on those points he makes, he's correct about them. But what frustrates me is he never said anything about the same conflicts of interest that Hillary Clinton had with the fucking Clinton Foundation. Yeah. We're t- taking money from Qatar and Saudi Arabia and fucking approving weapons deals and child soldiers in South Sudan and getting them a waiver for having child soldiers. And so you didn't have a dick to say about it when it was your preferred candidate. But now that it's Trump's in office, it's like, OK, well, now I'm just going to focus on his conflicts of interest and corruption. Like, mm-hmm. oh, so all of a sudden you're concerned about conflicts of interest and corruption. Look, <laughs> right. Again, I want to be clear. I'm happy when people attack Trump. I attack Trump on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. But you have to fucking use arguments that are reasonable. You can't – I am i don't want the left to totally become like the right. Just yeah. hacky fucking shitty arguments that are just trying to push the narrative – us right, them wrong, and you're not. You don't care about consistency. You don't care about hypocrisy. You don't care mm-hmm. about any of that stuff, because that's not the kind of left that I want to be a part of. And right. Again, so you alluded to it earlier. We've been working on something behind the scenes, and I'll be announcing it soon. But um, there is going to be a push to take back the Democratic Party and make them what they should have been all along. Nice. Yeah. Nice. That's good. Well, I'll definitely be on board for that as well, because I think that, you know, if, if we don't take control, then they're just going to run it into the ground and the country's going to get worse and worse. And like you said, I think there's going to be a lot of bad things that will happen that could have been prevented, like an economic crash and whatnot. So, yeah. And you can get two terms of president, grab him by the pussy. I don't even wait. 
to terms <laughs> right. of Mr. I had an unpopularity rating of 63 percent during the general election and won. The fact <laughs> that the Democrats can't beat that guy shows that the Democrats are fucking broken. And yeah, it's embarrassing. It's not even a good counter argument in this point. If somebody says, OK, well, she won the popular vote. Yeah, but you you sh you could have made it or it should be the case that he could have had – you could have spotted him five million votes to start and you still mm -hmm. win. You see right. what I'm saying? Like, right. OK, yeah, you won by two point something million popular votes. You should have won by like 15 million. Mm -hmm. It should have been a historic landslide. It should have been over 500 electoral votes. Yeah, she was playing on the easiest difficulty if this election were a video game. You you fucked up something that should have been a cakewalk. And when they brag about the popular vote, I'm sitting here just like going crazy because what they forget to tell you is that one poll from Reuters and Ipsos, anyways, it found out that more people were voting for Hillary Clinton to defeat Donald Trump than they were just voting for her because they liked her. So I don't think that's anything to brag about. Not being Trump and bragging about it is that's not something that you want to boast about. You should be embarrassed about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right, man. It, <laughs> it was a great conversation. I got to run now. All right. Well, thanks, man. Anything you want to plug or anything you want to um, shout um, out to your Twitter or whatnot? No, no. I just, uh, you know, I know you're going to upload this on your channel. I'm going to upload it on mine too. So I'll just tell everybody real quick. Uh, if you haven't yet, guys, check out uh, Humanist Report. Um, and you know, he's been called, I believe, gay me. That's what people have said. You're the, the gay, gay version of Kyle. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. You get a uh, double dose if you check out his show. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, it's been really fun to all of my subscribers who are watching. Please check out Kyle. I'm sure you already know about him because he's blowing up. He's the Michael Jordan of the uh, progressive movement on the, uh, on the internet. Please, yes. I'm uh, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, and name mm. any other fucking dominant. No, I'm kidding. Of, of course I'm not. <laughs> but thank you He's for the, the compliment. Christ. I appreciate that. Yes, I'm the Jesus. I'm the God of the left. No, I'm not. <laughs> but thanks, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem, man. Well, thank you so much. It's been great. Uh, really appreciate it. I had a great time. All right. Later, brother. Well, that's all I got for you guys today. I hope you guys all enjoyed this episode. Uh, you know, I had a lot of fun, and I want to welcome you to the channel if you just found us. And thank all of my members and Patreon patrons uh, and people who donate via PayPal because you really do help the show progress. Uh, and, and I really mean that. Like, you help us grow by allowing us the financial uh, ability to purchase things that we need for the show, like new software, new hardware. So thank you guys so much. You keep the show going. Uh, not only that, but you're making it better and bigger than ever. So thank you all so much for tuning in. I will see you all next week. I hope you have a good day.